uh, if we are ready, then um, Linda, I think we can go ahead. Um, we can open, um, we can host the opening session of, of the GACO. Um, and so to do that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Atan to give us an opening statement for GACOF 59 in August 2021. Over to you, Dr. Atan. Um, you need to unmute your microphone. Uh, <laughs> That's it's better. It's, it's still welcome. learning. <laughs> You're very <laughs> welcome, Dr. Atan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tiona. And uh, good morning, all uh, distinguished uh, guests, uh, friends, partners, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning uh, all uh, to to you all uh, for uh, this uh, 59 uh, meeting of the Greater Horn of Africa Climate Outlook Forum, also known as uh, GARCO. <clears throat> As you know, uh, climate-related hazards are becoming more intense and frequent uh, in, in our region, uh, most probably because of climate change or, or climate variability. Uh, this region, uh, is, as we're talking now, is, uh, is gripped by a drought on the eastern sector. Um, we have seen uh, several years of above average rainfall on the Western sector of the region. Uh, without doubt, uh, the average weather uh, or climate is in flux. Every year uh, where uh, the average is moving and this is making harder uh, an already harder job of uh, forecasting uh, the anomalies. Uh, within the past three years, we have seen a record uh, droughts and record rainfall uh, in some locations in this region. Uh, we are seeing more frequent extremes with higher climate variability, and that's leaving little time for communities to recover between shocks. As such, the most vulnerable in our population are exposed to extreme shocks with little or no time to recover between crisis. As we are gathered here today, there's an ongoing drought in the Eastern sector of the region. Uh, and if I remember well, uh, the region has almost, uh, on, from the last count, close to 40 million people in need of food aid. Uh, and that has been ongoing now for almost a year. And you add uh, uh, this pandemic uh, and, and, and a desert, an ongoing desert locust invasion that has started in 2019. But uh, so we have seen uh, warmer temperatures and excessive rainfalls in, in the western sector of the region with all the lakes in the greater uh, Rift Valley have recorded uh, levels that haven't been seen for over 60 years. Uh, this has provided uh, the conditions, uh, especially in the Western sector of the region, uh, for an ongoing infestation of a desert locust invasion that I say started in November of 2019. Now we're pushing on our uh, second year almost. To face the increase in climate, uh, this in climate hazards and challenges, uh, the region calls on all of us to accelerate our efforts to climate proof the region from the negative impacts of climate variability and climate change. We are privileged to have the, pre uh, the representative of the member countries with us here today to share their experiences regarding the level of preparedness and mitigation measures that were put in place by the, by the respective countries after the last forum that was held in February of this year. Ladies and gentlemen, ICPAC, uh, most of you know, but for those who don't know, is a specialized institution of EGAT, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, 
one of the seven RECs of the African Union. It is a regional climate center of excellence that creates regional products that include long range forecasts that support regional and national climate activities and thereby strengthen the capacity of the member states in the Greater Horn of Africa region to deliver better climate services to national users in order to improve the livelihoods of the population of the region and to build a resilience to climate shocks. ICPAC is also a WMO Regional Climate Center of Excellence for Eastern Africa that leads and coordinates uh, this GARC office in collaboration with the national meteorological agencies of the member countries uh, three times a year. We organize consensus outlook, producing consensus based user relevant climate outlook products in order to reduce climate related risks. Uh, for the coming season, in sectors of critical such economic significance to the, to the region, unusual those are defy uh, climate services uh, sectors that WMO has identified for security, agriculture, DRM, water, health. The GARCO Forum has made an enormous contribution to the improvement of dissemination of climate formation of disaster risk management and economic development in our region. The core concept of GARCOF is to deliver consensus based user relevant climate outlook products in real time through regional cooperation and partnerships. And we started this uh, GARCOF uh, uh, beside preparation. The actual GARCOF actually started a week ago, uh, last Monday. The forum brings together national, regional, and international climate experts to produce outlooks that are based on inputs from the national meteorological and hydrological services, regional institutions like ours, and global producers of climate predictions. By bringing together countries that have common climatological characteristics, the forum ensures consistencies in the access to interpretation of climate information. Products developed and issued at Garkov's held in early warning for early action, both at national and regional level, and, are, and they, are, they are designed to encourage climate smart development in all sectors to facilitate climate change adaptation and to enhance resilience. This is the 59 Garkov we're holding online. This is the fifth actual GARCOP that we're holding online. Uh, uh, 59 GARCOP is the fifth. Uh, we started on uh, 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 May of last year. The longevity of the forum, 23 years are running, and that even COVID could not stop us holding this meeting uh, is a testament to the usefulness of the forum. And my hope is that the next Garkov will be uh, in person as uh, the previous 54 were. But let's rem re remind all of us that an early warning without an early action has no benefit. In that regard, we are added, we are added few days for co-production. Co-producing climate information with users is key to giving producers and users of, of climate information a chance to interact and create information that can better can be better understood and used for decision making. Instead of producing products that suit that we understand and suit only only the producers as uh, co-producing, our hope is it will help produce products that are wanted and will be used uh, by the final users of, of this. Uh, this, pro this approach uh, will definitely enrich greatly the products and services we produce at ICPAC, but also at the uh, National Met and Hydro Services of the region. 
early warning are irre irrelevant uh, if they are not received, understood, and trusted by those who need to act, uh, especially uh, policymakers and the general public. So hopefully uh, this addition of co-producing uh, will make that a more uh, attainable than it has been in, in the past. Early warning messages uh, to at-risk communities need to be communicated well. In addition, response capacity of the communities is sometimes weak in many countries, as fundamental knowledge on risk and information on expected impact often are not appropriately communicated. We need to move uh, to forecast uh, based uh, to an impact uh, based forecast. Uh, that's more uh, what the weather will do and less on how the weather will be. And that's what we uh, what we are what we are uh, we, we are doing in the sectoral science meeting that we had the last few days. And uh, the presentation will be done uh, later today. Uh, of the outcome from those sectoral meetings. We need to improve policy, uh, improve uh, policy and institutional linkages with communities at risk, uh, with, with the climate services done at the regional and the national level. Uh, at ICPAC and uh, with the National Met, we have been working uh, on, on, on better tailoring uh, these products so they can be, uh, uh, use it and want it, and 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 I my hope is that we evaluate how these uses these products are taken, uh, if we are improving or not, and I hope uh, this will be part of the discussion that we're having uh, we'll have later on today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, ICPAC will continue to uh, innovate and improve uh, constantly by making a deliberate effort to deliver better climate services to our member countries in the coming years. Even though from past experience, our seasonal forecast has been uh, good. Uh, uh, I'm not, uh, I, I wouldn't include that good on the last one. So hopefully uh, it will come through the discussion uh, that we'll have uh, in the next uh, actual hour. We have seen market improvement in seasonal forecast since we have started the objective seasonal uh, forecasting, replacing the consensus-based uh, climate outlook uh, on the last two years. And we will move in this direction more as, uh, as time comes in. Uh, my hope is that uh, with the improvement in our uh, uh, computing system, we might uh, will produce uh, more uh, as a, a sample of uh, forecasts. And hopefully our uh, average will, will improve. I will advise everybody to follow the monthly update uh, done by ICPAC and by the National Med Institution. So we update this forecast every month. And, and usually as you get closer and closer, it becomes better. So. Yes, uh, I would advise everybody to 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 look at the at the, at the monthly uh, updates of, of the seasonal forecast. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are grateful to national uh, hydromet agencies and our development partners for the support. Uh, finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the African Development Bank, uh, the European Union, and UK uh, the UK DFID uh, for supporting this forum. With those uh, few remarks, I wish you all good deliberation and thank you all. Back to you, uh, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Atan. Um, and yeah, very good messages around what we, um, the situation that we are in and the role that ICPAC can play. Um, so thank you. We are now officially into GACOP 59. Um, I realize we actually started a little earlier than originally planned, which is great. So it means we have good time to cover all the deliberations that we want to get through during the day. Um, so now I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Averu um, to 
um, give us a briefing on what's going to be happening um, today and the purpose of today's event. Um, Mr. Adhera, would you like us to share screen for you? I think I will try to share. Okay, that's good, great. Um, and if you're able to put your video on, that would be great. There we go. Good morning. Um, wonderful. Okay. Uh, over to you, Mr. Averu. Okay. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, I think, uh, as uh, Fiona said, I'm going to present on, uh, give briefing of the forum event, uh, including the related the workshops. Um, hmm. And I will start with the, the objective of GACO 59. Uh, the main objective really is to present the consolidated uh, uh, objective uh, regional climate outlook for the October to December 2021 season. We will also uh, present implications of the forecast and the response strategies. What our sector has been discussing uh, the last few days, uh, leading to yesterday, is what you will mean. The summary will be presented. And then um, we provide a regional interaction platform uh, for decision makers, climate scientists, research scientists, users of climate information, and development partners. Uh, this is actually what makes uh, regional climate outlook forums as a component of user interface platform of the global framework for climate services when we, we provide this interaction uh, between uh, many players. Then at the end of the day, uh, the, no, okay, towards the end, before of course maybe uh, lunch time, uh, the director will release the statement and thereafter a press release. And this will be followed by development of a summary for decision makers, which will be also circulated later. Uh, before this forum, we had the pre forum activities or workshops. Uh, the key one was the, uh, the virtual workshop by climate scientists uh, from 16th to 20th of August to develop objective regional and downscaled national climate outlook forum, uh, outlooks for October to December 2021 season. And they also reviewed the performance of the last season, which of course has not ended, uh, but they anyway reviewed what has happened so far uh, the actual review will be presented uh, maybe in the next forum when the whole season is over. Uh, we had also co production workshop with the key sectors on 24th of August uh, because nowadays we are emphasizing on co production of climate services between the climate uh, providers and uh, the, the sector users. We had also climate change workshop on 24, the, the same 24th August. Um, and all sectors, we had uh, the specific sector workshops yesterday, 25th, where we started with preliminary and all sectors uh, broke into uh, prior sec uh, sessions where they discussed their sector specific issues, which will, of course will be presented later on. In this, they reviewed the lesson learned in the use of uh, the previous uh, uh, outlook and also formulated implications for the October to December 21 uh, climate outlook and the response strategies. The theme of this uh, forum is climate services for resilience. We are very aware that our region is very prone to uh, climate variability and change and uh, the socioeconomic system is very sensitive to climate revelation and change, mainly due to high dependence on rainfed agriculture and pastoralism. Uh, 
Climate extremes often lead to migration and increased risk of uh, conflict of uh, limited natural resources, such as pasture and rangeland. The hydrometeorological hazards account for about 90% of the natural hazards induced the disasters in our region. Climate change is expected to lead to increase in the intensity and the frequency of these extremes and hazard-induced disasters. In this regard, climate services in support of sector decision making and early action are an essential and an intent contribution to increase climate resilience of our co communities in the region. And you know, the, our vision as EGAND, your vision 2027, where to have resilient ecosystems and communities. Uh, to uh, climate shocks. The program, as uh, Fiona has said, I think we started a bit earlier, or, uh, uh, we have already going through uh, the open session. Then this will be followed by feedback uh, of 20, uh, the last season and uh, the, imp the impacts which will be shared by Philip Omondi. Then thereafter, uh, we will have the presentation of October to December season uh, focus. Of course, within that, we will have the global state of climate uh, before we go to uh, the, 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 the focus and the discussions. We will have a virtual break. Then uh, after we resume, we will go to sector uh, implications of the forecast in, uh, by the in sectors. And then uh, this will be followed by short plenary on climate change. And then we'll go to session on partnerships, where we tell you about the initiatives we have uh, with the partners. Uh, just brief as a... Uh, 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 kind of uh, information sharing of what is going on. Then this will be followed by the release of the statement and uh, sign the uh, lunch, short break lunch. Then uh, sector, uh, I mean, we have the three signed events which will take place in the afternoon. And I think uh, this is all we had uh, for briefing. And we wish you uh, 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 good participation. Fiona. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Averu. Yes, we were a bit on a roll. We realized in terms of timing, the, um, the email went that people received um, for GACOF actually said everything was starting at 8 a.m. And the last couple of days, we've been starting the sessions at 9 a.m. promptly. Um, and I think we thought, well, we are all here. We are over 100 people, so let's let's get going. Um, so thank you very much, and um, we will continue now um, with our next session. And um, I will hand over to Philip to moderate us through the next session, which is looking back at the June, July, August season and seeing what happened during that season climatologically and then from the perspective of all the um, sectors as well. Um, so yeah, if you're able to stop sharing your screen, that's great. Thank you, Zachary. And um, over to you, Philip. Uh, thank you, uh, Fiona. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, Fiona uh, kindly display the, uh, the program so that uh, members can see the order in which they are going to present before I call the first presenter, kindly. <clears throat> so, um, as we are getting into the, the session, um, I want to thank everybody, every presenter, uh, sector groups, 
that have uh, taken their time to uh, work on around the clock to make sure that uh, they put in order the June, July, August uh, 2021 session on performance, uh, I mean, uh, uh, impacts. And we also thank uh, the climate team for putting together the performance. And uh, I want to uh, uh, call upon uh, Mr. Anthony Mwavi to start us off by giving us the, uh, the performance. All right, thank you, Dr. Philip. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Anthony Mwanti, and I'm going to take you through the performance of the ongoing season. Yeah, so before we look at the performance of the ongoing season, we need to look at a review of the previous season and uh, gauge the assessment. So this was March, April, May, that was issued in GACO 57. On the left is uh, the forecast that, uh, let me get the pointer. Yes, the left is the forecast that was issued in GACO 57. And in the shades of green, this forecast favored uh, above average rainfall over most areas in Tanzania, Western Kenya, Eastern Uganda, and Eastern South Sudan, as well as uh, parts of Western Ethiopia. Now in zone two, for the category Z equal probability, and uh, in zone three, we, the focus favored uh, below average to normal conditions. And we see on the right, these were the observations presented in tassile format, with also the percentage of normal overlaid. So in in the red shades to orange, these are below average uh, areas. The cyan color presents the average situation while the shades of green present regions that recorded um, above average rainfall. So we see that uh, the regions that were forecasted to uh, have probabilities varying above average to normal, especially Tanzania, Western Kenya, Uganda, we see those regions recorded uh, above average, normal conditions uh, of concern would be the Eastern areas, especially in Eastern Kenya, through to Somalia, Southern Somalia, and also parts of Northern where the season was largely below average, as well as Eastern Uganda and Southern uh, South Somalia, sorry, Southern South Sudan. And when we look at the statistics, for the below average category, the focus was 63.6% uh, perc correct. For the normal, it was 49.6. And for the above uh, normal category, it was 63.1% correct. Now moving to the current season, we look at the importance of the season in the region by looking at the fraction of rainfall that is received in the current season to the annual total. And the higher the percentage, the more the contribution. So we see in regions of Sudan, and Northern South Sudan, and also Northern East Western Ethiopia, also Northwestern Eritrea, this season contributes up to uh, at least 70%. So, these are the areas of interest for the JJS season. So for the rest of our analysis, we may focus on these areas. And now we want to understand how the season started. Uh, this is the observed onset, and we define the onset as uh, the first day when we record uh, at least 20 millimeters within three days. and for the next 21 days, we do not have a dry spell that is greater than seven days. And looking at this map, we see uh, on the legend here, by the 20th of May, we had already onset established in areas uh, 
that are indicated by the gray color, that is South Sudan and also uh, Western Ethiopia. This indicates uh, rain was progressing through uh, from the previous season. And by the end of July, we had onset established in central to Southern Sudan and as well as Western uh, Eritrea and Northern Ethiopia. And these are the regions that are of importance to this season. But we need to look at, uh, compared to what was forecasted, what was, uh, how, was the, how was the performance of the forecast? So on the left here is the forecast anomaly in terms of the onset, and on the right is what was observed. So the forecast indicated that we were expecting an early onset in regions of Southern Sudan, uh, Western Ethiopia, and parts of Northern South Sudan. And when you look at the observations over this area, we see some good correspondence that the onset was early, but we also note in some areas, the onset was late up to weeks. Uh, in parts of central Sudan, where the onset was forecasted to be late, up to two weeks, uh, we see the onset came in time. I'm moving forward to the overall seasonal performance with the available monthly data. To the left, this was the forecast that largely favored above average rainfall in most uh, areas where the season is active. Uh, comparing this with the observations that we have to date, on the right, we have uh, the tassiles overlaid with the percentage of normal for June and July. So largely we see above average rainfall for both months of June and July in Sudan. Uh, improvements in uh, Eritrea moving from June to July and also in Northern Ethiopia. By July, the rains were above average. Of concern could be parts of uh, Central Ethiopia where the rains have been below average for the first two months of the season. Also, we note some improvement in the rains in South Sudan from June to July, the rains were largely normal in most areas of South Sudan. Anthony, you have uh, uh, three minutes to go. All right. Now, using all the valuable data from 1st of July, June up to 20th of August, we computed the SPI just to assess how, this, how wet or dry the season is. Largely, we see it's a wet season in Sudan, normal season in Eritrea and also parts of uh, Northern South Sudan, as well as Northern, uh, Northern Ethiopia. Uh, but there are indications of dry conditions in um, uh, Central Southern Ethiopia, parts of Southern South Sudan, and also Uganda. The white region here is masked out because this is not an active season during this time of the year. In terms of temperature, on the left, these were the forecast that favored warmer than average on the part of Western and also extreme Northern. And the observations so far indicate that uh, using June and July data, here we present as standardized anomalies. The region is largely warmer than average with the exceptions of border areas in Sudan and South Sudan and also parts of uh, Central Tanzania. And using station records, here we present uh, the average minimum temperature for July for some selected stations in the region. The black bar is the long-term mean or the climatology, while the red is the current observation together with the blue. And we see most stations are actually warmer than uh, the average and only one station in this uh, selection in Mutwara, Tanzania is colder than climatology. So in average, the rainfall season is good, 
especially in Sudan, but the rest of the northern countries show uh, an, an average situation in terms of the rainfall. The onset was on time to early, but we have areas where the onset also delayed and temperatures largely are warmer than average. That's the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anthony, for that uh, a good presentation. Uh, we have seen uh, the performance. Uh, we need to understand as from your explanation that uh, uh, we are not yet uh, out of the season, but uh, we can see uh, what has been uh, uh, verified so far. Thank you very much. A quick look at the chat. I don't see anybody uh, throwing a question to you. So should you have any question, should you have any concern, please uh, feel free to uh, jump into the chat uh, utility and uh, ask your question, Anthony, uh, and the rest of the climate scientists would be uh, very much uh, ready uh, to answer your questions. So thank you very much, uh, Anthony. Uh, from this now, we are going to move uh, to uh, the next uh, session, I mean, uh, the next group category of the presenters. You want to listen from the, <clears throat> you want to listen from uh, the sector groups, what uh, uh, became of the JJ sessions in terms of sectors. So we have sectors as in the program, agriculture, we have conflict, we have disaster, livestock regulance, we have health, we have water resources and environment and forestry uh, sectors. So uh, without wasting much time, I want to call upon the first presenter to quickly present in uh, five minutes, and this will be agriculture and food security. So Oliver, if you can share your slide and move on. Thank you. So remember, questions are on chat box. For the sake of time, we may not entertain verbal questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, my name is Oliver Kipkoge, and I'm going to present on behalf of uh, uh, Agriculture and Food Security Member State Focal Points, who sent me the reports. So first of all, I'm going to start with what was observed as uh, positive impacts over the previous season, which is June, July, August. So first of all, the dry conditions which are actually experienced in some places suppressed breeding and spread of the desert locusts, particularly in Ethiopia, Sudan, and Somalia. Also, uh, there were financial institutions institutions that provided a shorter rehabilitation of major infrastructure, including irrigation infrastructure, particularly in Somalia. And this actually improved access of uh, water to farmers. Uh, also improvement in food security in eastern and western parts of uh, Equatoria, that is in South Sudan. And also due to uh, issues of uh, high prices of cotton in Sudan, farmers were motivated to actually expand on um, production of the same, uh, and this was instead of uh, producing sorghum, so they prefer to produce uh, cotton. Uh, there was also in, uh, enhanced rains in July, which actually revived uh, wilting uh, sorghum crops in Paramoja. And in parts of um, mostly in uh, Burundi and Tanzania, this is a climatological dry area, and activities were mainly uh, restricted to marshlands, and it was also good for harvesting of season B crops in Burundi and also main season crops in uh, Tanzania. So in terms of uh, negative impacts, there were issues of uh, crop uh, failure due to particularly due to uh, moisture stress and also uh, instances of uh, long dry spells in the belt growing areas of uh, Ethiopia. So, uh, and also some dry spells in Capoeira in uh, South Sudan. Uh, there were also inc incidences of flooding and water logging in Ethiopia, Sudan, Somalia, and Uganda. Um, examples of the impact is, for instance, highway linking uh, Blue Nile to the Khartoum was destroyed, and also including uh, feeder roads in Gedarif. Also, destruction of 4,000 acres of agricultural irrigated land due to flooding. 
Also, there were July flash floods in Kasese, areas of uh, Uganda that also destroyed uh, crop fields. And flooding in some parts of South Sudan, including the Ongle, Bor, and also Northern Balgazal. So continuation, there was also issues of a tribal conflict in Gader locality, and also this led to reduction in cultivated crop area. There were instances of isolated and scattered locusts that were reported in Kasala state, and also issues of um, pests and diseases in Uganda. And also the issue of COVID-19 also con continued to disrupt livelihoods, and uh, this actually impacted negatively on the overall food security si situation in the region. So uh, some of the long-term observed seasonal changes, there were dry spells, particularly in July in Sudan states and August in uh, South Kedarif. So these are normally not normal in those times. There were also high rainfall that was observed in July in uh, Ethiopia, uh, which, which actually normally happens in August. Rising water levels also that displaced uh, hundreds of people in Uganda and issues of uh, instances of extreme floods and storms in Rwanda and also parts of Uganda. So in terms of interventions, uh, uh, first of all, dissemination of the outlook and agro meteorological advisories were undertaken regionally and uh, promotion of uh, crop and pasture fields that is in Ethiopia, water harvesting, distribution of agricultural inputs and also regular scouts. This is particularly in Ethiopia. National campaigns were undertaken on tree plantation and also soil erosion control in parts of, um, particularly in Burundi and Ethiopia. And also small scale irrigation technologies were also employed in Burundi and Rwanda. So these are some of the impact uh, pictures that we received from our focal points. So thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver, for doing a good job. You have uh, utilized your five minutes well. Uh, we move quickly to the next uh, sector. And I want to welcome, uh, I want to welcome conflict uh, sector to present. Uh, hi, Philip, uh, who's standing in for conflict? I don't see Andrew. It's no longer Andrew. Uh, we have. It's it's Hamoud. Hamoud, Hamoud? yes, we have yes. Hamoud. Hamoud, yes. Hamoud uh, uh, if you are and, listening to uh, us, I can share screen. He asked me to share screen for him. Uh, let's just check if Hamoud is actually here. Um, I am not. Uh, I don't Actually, see Hamoud. I think maybe you jump to the next sector and then we can come back to Hamoud. We can come back to conflict. Okay, okay. Uh, we move to livestock. Uh, can we move in this order? Livestock, uh, you are going to present. After livestock, we're going to listen to water sector. Then we get to health. After health, we'll get to uh, forestry, then uh, disaster, and then conflict will now come last. So can we keep that order so that uh, we keep time as well? So livestock, Caroline, if you are ready, please, the stage is yours. Uh, good morning. Uh, can I have my presentation? Just hold on and I'll share it. Coming up. Okay, is this, I hope this is the correct one. I hope so. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will quickly go through uh, the presentation for the livestock sector as has been received from the member states. Um, I had feedback from uh, all the countries that uh, are represented in IGAD. 
uh, for JJA, uh, the one positive impact. Sorry, can we go back? One step back, please. Um, sorry, can we go to the positive impacts? The previous slide. Thank you. Um, we find, see that this season is important in Djibouti and Sudan. And as we have seen from the uh, validation that uh, the rains came in as was expected, the season is still on. And because of this, there's adequate pastures um, in uh, Djibouti, in Sudan, uh, parts of Uganda, uh, parts of Ethiopia, um, and South Sudan. Uh, generally in these uh, areas, the animals are in, are in good body condition. Uh, and um, the pastoralists engaged in water harvesting and, uh, and other activities regarding securing the pasture and water for their livestock. Uh, next. Um, however, we see some negative uh, impacts uh, within the same season. Uh, for example, we had floods in, in, in Ethiopia, uh, especially the Afar region. Um, in the lowlands of South Sudan and in Sudan. Uh, in, in Ethiopia, we are also experiencing drought conditions in the Borana zone, uh, some districts in Eastern and Western Harage, which have resulted in uh, livestock deaths. And the same is happening in Dasanich and Nyangatom. Because of these uh, dry uh, spells, there's uh, a lot of animal movement uh, and witnessed in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Sudan. Um, then uh, we noted that the price of milk and eggs were increasing with, uh, in, in Ethiopia and Sudan, and this was attributed to supply and demand and economic challenges that came with the variations to the currency due to the COVID uh, pandemic. In Kenya, there were resource-based conflicts that were reported in Laikipia because of the dry conditions that I experienced in the northeastern part of Kenya. Um, and also some tensions that uh, were arising in uh, South Sudan as the pastoralists uh, moving their uh, animals from the lowlands, which where there was a lot of rain to the highlands so that for the dry conditions in the highlands. Uh, in Kenya, animal body conditions have deteriorated so much and um, Kenya Meat Commission has taken up uh, uh, some task of uh, strategic destocking um, from the pastoralists currently in Kenya. 10 of the ASAL countries, counties, sorry, are uh, already in uh, red alert. Uh, next. Uh, there were a few incidences of diseases um, as usually attributed to the season, but notably there was an outbreak of an unknown camel disease in Ethiopia, which is still being investigated and foot and mouth disease in uh, Ethiopia. Um, and for, uh, desert locust, we see that this is still a threat um, in Ethiopia and uh, in Somalia and part of Djibouti. Next. Next slide, please. Um, I won't go much into this because we've seen from uh, what has been mentioned by the previous presenters that uh, generally we are observing uh, an increase in extreme events, uh, which is leading to the the floodings and the onset dates have uh, become late, and this was witnessed in Sudan and Ethiopia. Uh, and in Kenya, Uganda, South Sudan, we see that uh, even within the season, there were longer than usual dry spells. Uh, next slide. Um, for the implementation of the advisories that we gave uh, for this season, uh, they were impl implemented in the various countries. So we see that there was a lot of disease surveillance, especially against Rift Valley fever in the areas where they had indicated that they would be above normal rainfall. Uh, vaccinations uh, and treatment of animals happened in the countries that are outlined there against the major uh, notifiable diseases that are also indicated there. However, the COVID pandemic um, for example, in Kenya, affected the turnout for animal vaccinations because we know there's a lot of uh, social distancing and people are avoiding uh, to be in crowded areas. And in Ethiopia, uh, part of that was also hindered by the security problems that are experienced in the conflict areas of uh, Ethiopia. Uh, you have, uh, Caroline, you have uh, one minute. Uh, sure, sure. Um, 
the people in Ethiopia and parts of Kenya and Uganda took advantage of that. Uh, uh, the conditions that were prevailing to develop animal feeds. And in Kenya, we've seen that uh, the Kenya Meat Commission uh, played a major role in offtake of livestock, and that managed to keep the terms of trade uh, favorable and stable. Um, in Uganda, however, the price was low, and this was attributed to the COVID-19 restrictions. Next. Um, yeah, and again, also in part of implementing of uh, the adversaries in Uganda, the challenge was uh, because of the delayed onset, uh, the yields were low, and this has affected the availability of feed for particularly poultry and pig industry in, in, in Uganda. Um, Ethiopia have embarked on a large scale tree planting, and in Sudan, we got reports that the One Health coordination uh, was beefed up. Uh, next. Thank you. That's uh, in brief what I can report from the livestock sector. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Caroline, for that presentation. I request uh, uh, water. Uh, Dr. Hassan. Water. Uh, thank you, Philip. This session will be handled by Iqbal. Then uh, Mohammed will handle the next one. Okay. Water. Yeah. So Iqbal can go ahead. Who can go ahead? Iqbal Salah, she can go ahead for this session. Can you share the presentation, please? Um, Mohammed, which it, presentation is this? The water one? Or which uh, yes. one are we doing now? Yes, this is for water. Uh, this session of water will be handled by Iqbal, according to right. Dr. Mohammed. Okay. So Iqbal can go ahead, she can unmute and share her screen. Right. If you need help with sharing screen, I can do it for you. Meanwhile, help to get ready after water. Yes. Yeah. Good morning. Do you hear me? Yes, we, we can hear you. you. Okay, I will present water and energy sector, the analysis and the impact of June, July, August. And uh, this sorry, is sorry, sorry, Iqbal, Iqbal. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't see your screen from my end. I'm we not sure can, if we you can, can see, see your screen, but it's not the presentation. It's the Zoom screen we are looking at. Yes, yes, that's what I meant. Do, so can uh, you... Do you have the presentation or do you want... Are you able to share it or let me know and I can share for you? Okay. There we are, wonderful. Are you able to put into a uh, full, full screen? Yes. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Uh, the positive impact for this season, there is drop in lake levels due to low rainfall, specifically in Lake Victoria. This happened in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. There is enough water for hydropower generation in Uganda and flourishing the Iberian fishing in South Sudan. Also, the water level in White Nile remain deep enough for navigation for South Sudan. There is increase in groundwater recharge, seasonal and perennial stream, and shallow groundwater and energy generation. Uh, excuse me, area, excuse me, Iqbal. Iqbal, yes. kindly uh, get into presentation mode and then roll your screen or your slides, please. It's stuck from my end. Yeah, I didn't, uh, and there is, 
Um, Iqbal, you if you see. prefer, you can um, uh, stop sharing screen. I'll share for you. Okay. Um, here we go. Okay. Um, I think you are here. Is that right? Yes, the positive impact. And there is off-season offered an opportunity to raise awareness of the community and involve them in adaptation activity in Rwanda. Here we can see the drop level in Lake Victoria and Lake Nakoro. Next slide, please. The negative impact for this season, uh, there is uh, Reservoir water level have been falling steadily and uh, leading to reduce hydropower in Kenya. The lake levels remain high for Kuyoga and Albert lakes in Uganda and causing displacement. In Ethiopia, Somalia, Sudan, and Uganda, floods led to the river system bursting banks. And there is interruption of construction related project in Uganda and increase in water prices for Somalia. The water level remain high for White Nile and for the, uh, and it is maximum than the last 15 years in South Sudan. There is out, power outage in Sudan and also there is impact on public health uh, due to flash floods in Sudan. There is many measures taken by country, for example, the relocation of household and the risk in Sudan and Uganda, and the early warning in Kenya and Sudan. Next slide, please. Uh, for the summary long term observe, there is a steady decrease in lake water levels, early start of the season in Sudan, the implementation that taken an impact and advisory in this season, June, July, August. Some uh, taken advi advisory through workshop, social media platform, and TV, and also via the Ministry of Water through hydrologists working together and the National Multi Sector Water Forum. Next slide, please. Here in, there is, uh, in this photo, floods and drought in Sudan and the drought in Kenya. And it shows also the hydrograph of a station at dam in Sudan. It's you be a border. Next slide, please. Here it shows the hail store around Nagara in Kagira region in Tanzania. Thank you. Next slide, thank you. Thank you, Salah, for the quick presentation. <clears throat> you have actually saved us some one minute. I can see there is a question for you uh, in the chat box. Please make attempt to uh, answer Dr. Sabiti. He wants to know how to explain the drop in lake levels. So you can work together. Dr. Hassan will also uh, join you in uh, answering the questions on the chat. OK, thank you. Yeah, next uh, presenter will be um, the health sector. And I want to welcome Dr. Ajunya to present on behalf of the health team. Dr. Ajunya, are you sharing your slides? Alternatively, you can be help if you want to be assisted in sharing the slides. Uh, Philip, I'm informed uh, that uh, it's, it's uh, David Gikungu, but uh, let me also enable uh, uh, Aguna, Adunya, so Kimoto. that they can, one of them will handle it. Kimoto? Uh, yes. It's, it's, yes. Uh, it's Adunya for this one, for JJA. Okay. I will be doing OND. Okay, so Dr. Yeah. Adunya is enabled, he can go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, 
I'll share my slide. Allow me to share my slide. Otherwise, you can share from uh, the coordinator's side. I'm not enabled to share. That's okay. Yeah, I can see. Thank you very much. This is Adunya from uh, a called Addis Ababa. Uh, I'm uh, representing nine countries, uh, and this uh, presentation is consolidated by our uh, focal person, Paulino, and uh, I'm going to stay with you for the coming four to five minutes in uh, four slides. We are prepared for slides. Next slide. Good. The positive side of uh, the last season is uh, uh, reduction of cases uh, due to flu, common cold, and the dirty hand disease following the use of masks and hand washing as following the COVID uh, protocols. And uh, there was no diarrhea or pneumonia in Burundi. Uh, for Somalia, no desert locusts invasion. And for Ethiopia, as it was already pre presented in one of the sectors. Uh, there was a good uh, uh, output of uh, rain and there was no interruption of electricity and energy supply. That makes uh, healthcare services uh, sustainable. And the other thing is uh, good food production, especially the animal uh, uh, feed is uh, available. Next slide. Uh, this, uh, the following slides are the negative uh, aspects or impacts on health. Uh, Mosquito-borne diseases like malaria, they were abundant in all the countries, nine countries reported. Acute watery diarrhea or cholera, uh, some countries call acute watery diarrhea, others are still bold, bold enough to say cholera. There was outbreak in uh, Somalia. There was nutrition deficiency traits in Kenya, especially in the northern and northeastern. Uh, internal displacement in and urban poor in urban poor Somalia. Typhoid and dysentery, dust storms in June caused allergic disease and bronchial asthma, snake bites and scorpion stings in Sudan. Uh, upsurge of hepatitis E cases in. Uh, Benitu, internal displacement in Kamtu, South Sudan. COVID-19, especially the Delta variant, which is uh, notoriously affecting most parts of the world. And uh, Burundi, South Sudan, Kenya, Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Rwanda. So uh, those uh, countries uh, uh, have reported uh, Delta variant. In Burundi, sorry, yeah, in Rwanda, there was a case of uh, schistosomiasis. In Burundi, again, this season had normal dry season, but August was uh, with heavy rain uh, in districts of, some districts of Burundi. More unusual cold winds and cloudy during the day and the night, particularly during June, July, and beginning of August in Somalia. There is unexpected rainfall occurred in the north and western in July in Rwanda. Uh, compared to previous years, especially 2016 and 2020, malaria cases were reduced in Ethiopia. And there was no diarrhea or uh, pneumonia in Burundi. So this, the last three uh, points refer to the positive uh, aspects of the season. No outbreak of vector borne disease in Tanzania. Next slide. Uh, 
coming to the long, uh, the, the impact, uh, the, the implementation of uh, the interventions, long lasting insecticidal nets, that is a part of vector control activities in all countries that is related to malaria particularly. Personal hygiene, uh, especially using drinking and safe water, wash hands, cook food well, clean and up safety, safely in all countries, comprehensive humanitarian responses to cover nutritional deficiency in Somalia, Kenya, and Ethiopia. Uh, these are where uh, there are uh, internal displacement. Availing of vaccines and the gloves and masks to all countries related to uh, COVID-19. Enhancing surveillance, contingency planning, and uh, pre-positioning of essential supplies. This is done in all countries. Door-to-door mass drug administration for schizosomiasis deworming in Rwanda. Next, uh, thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Adunya, for the presentation. You have eaten into our one minute, but because we are in good time, I had to just be patient with you. Thank you very much. Next uh, sector uh, will be um, environment and forestry. Environment and forestry. Is it Eugene to present? Yes, Eugene, you are now the co-host. Go ahead, share your slides and uh, save your minutes. Uh, good morning, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Eugene Tejamai. I will be presenting on behalf of uh, Environment and Forestry. So report received from uh, Burundi, Djibouti, Kenya, South Sudan, Sudan, Tanzania, and uh, Uganda. So the positive impacts for the June to August uh, season. So there was above, uh, above average rainfall that was observed. This uh, favored the production of uh, good forage and also availability of water for wildlife and uh, livestock in uh, Ethiopia, South Sudan, Sudan, and uh, Uganda. There was also good forestry productivity as a result of uh, good rains. So we observed the uh, ARI establishment, survival and better growth of, uh, of already planted trees in Kenya, Uganda, Sudan, and Tanzania. Uh, good trees uh, seed production in Sudan, uh, good natural regeneration in the forest in central sectors, and the other natural sectors uh, in Sudan. Then there was also reduced uh, pest and disease infection in trees observed in Uganda, and mangrove restoration in Djibouti, Eritrea, and uh, Kenya. So the negative uh, impacts for the June to August uh, uh, rainfall season. So there was uh, uh, observed soil erosion and degradation due to high rains in Djibouti, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and South Sudan. Uh, reduction of forage and uh, water for wildlife and livestock in Kenya, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and Tanzania. There was also prolonged uh, drought uh, causing degradation of habitats, wildlife migration, and uh, human wildlife conflict in Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, strong winds limiting air security patrols in protected areas in Kenya. Uh, increased number of uh, fire incidences in protected areas and the uh, forest observed in Burundi, Kenya, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Uganda. There was also incidences of deforestations due to agricultural expansion, charcoal production, uh, timber businesses in Eritrea, Ethiopia, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Uganda, and also for oil production in South Sudan. So increased costs in forestry operations associated with challenging infrastructure due to high rains, so damaging to roads in Kenya, South Sudan, and Uganda. Uh, abundant fodder grass that attracted a considerable uh, amount of uh, nomads, group of nomads, uh, who caused damages to the generations in the younger trees, South Sudan and Sudan. Uh, increased pest and diseases in forestry, observed in Tanzania. Increased tree mortality due to drought and uh, heat in forestry, observed in Tanzania. 
then flooding in oil fields, uh, polluting drinking water in uh, South Sudan. So the graphs are showing the number of uh, fire incidences that uh, happened in the region. And top right, we have uh, Tarangire National Park in Tanzania, the dark green and uh, representing the uh, vegetation development. So we have uh, had good uh, biomass development from the previous season, from the mum season. And uh, orange representing the current fires, dark, dark, and uh, black bars representing long term average of fires. So in all incidences, Tanzania, uh, lower left, Uganda, Rikimboro National Park, and the lower right, Burundi, Rubogo National Park, where we have uh, higher numbers uh, compared to long term uh, average. So the advisories that were implemented. So there was a soil conservation, landscape and ecosystem restorations in Djibouti, Eritrea, and Kenya, fire management practices, clearing of uh, fire breaks, uh, area burning, and others. So we observed in the uh, rehabilitation of burnt areas in Kenya, Sudan, Tanzania, and Uganda. Enhanced success forest reparations due to better planning, including species site matching and timely planting, Kenya and Uganda. Uh, increased surveillance in human wildlife hotspots reported by Kenya, uh, increasing uh, forest reconnectivity to enhance natural resilience reported by Tanzania, uh, increasing the area under forest through afforestation and deforestation, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, and improved early warning and dissemination of climate information in South Sudan and uh, Ethiopia. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Eugene. Uh the presentation and the time also well spent. Uh, you are right on the dot. Uh, the next uh, uh, sector, uh, which is the second last, is the disaster risk management. Can we have uh, Julie sharing his screen and present on behalf of the DRM team? Thank you, Dr. Philip. So I'll present the June, July, August impact in behalf of the DRM. And just as reported earlier, the season was generally well for the Northern sector, which was positive for major, majorly the two sectors, which is agriculture and water sector, as well as the livestock. And just to note, we didn't have any emergency declared for any country during that season. However, the number of cases we had reported, which had a negative impact, and majorly, if you watch on the news, you'll see flood and drought, which were mainly picked out. So we'll share with you a summary of all the impact we received, rather the, the hazard or just we received from the member states, the focal points for the DRM, and they are given the different scores in percentages, COVID being the major one, and this has been shared earlier with the other presenters, which really affected the individual sectors. So overall, it had the 100% score. This was followed by floods, which affected Ethiopia, Somalia, South Sudan, and even majorly Sudan, which is even currently ongoing. Kenya and Uganda, majorly western part of Kenya is also affected. This also had a score of at least over 80%. A collation of some pocket disasters in the, in the different countries reported in Ethiopia, Kenya, Sudan and South Sudan were conflict. Some bit of hailstone, strong winds, fall and uh, some bushfire or just an outbreak of fires. This doesn't entirely mean they happen in one country, but they are put in the different, uh, I mean, the four countries highlighted. We also have drought, which is even currently ongoing in Kenya and Somalia, which is also reported. And others which had at least a 15% score were landslide in Ethiopia, there's a locust and other epidemic. So based on the tracking of COVID-19 by IGED, just wanted to point out that the last season, which was MAM, when we reported, we had a very high number of deaths in the region. And at least this has reduced uh, this season that we are reporting now. 
the increase from the pre, from mom to now was around 5,000 uh, reported deaths. So mom had the highest number, but at least this season is a bit uh, reduced. In terms of impact photos, we we had some received from Ethiopia, and the top left is Addis Ababa, and another one from South Sudan, which is the bottom left, and some a bit of a satellite analysis for Khartoum, which they highlighted the colors indicate areas covered by or flood or water. But then all that we tried to collate it in a map to identify areas which were largely affected or people who were largely affected by disasters. And this is only up to mid-August, it's not for the entire season. And what we were looking or what we looked at here, majorly flood, drought, landslide, hailstorm and strong winds. Uh, so we had Somalia having the highest number followed by Kenya, but the Kenya and uh, Somalia numbers in millions, which is very far from the rest of the region. And we, we know that this could include the IPC report on the highest number of people affected in terms of food security. But then the major hazard that were reported here for these countries were drought and floods which are both extremes of the rainfall affecting a number of people. In Ethiopia, we had both flood as well and landslide, as well as uh, strong wind and hailstorm. Because again, this, uh, the Northern part, it was a major season for them during the GGN. So flood came in as the major disaster that had a high impact on people. And also the number of deaths reported, Kenya gave the highest number followed by Ethiopia and Sudan. Recently, or rather the last few days, we also had a report from South Sudan that uh, the flood uh, killed seven children in the northern part of, of South Sudan. So these figures are just based on the mid season, not entirely the whole season. In terms of people displaced, and this focused only on flood and lake rise, and I remember when we discussed Nako production, Ethiopia, Lake Tana was actually rising and displaced some people. So the displacement are basically on flood and landslide. And the numbers are very high in Ethiopia. But we have at least uh, also over 3,000 in Kenya and uh, 3,000 in Somalia. Basically, Somalia would also be affected by the rains which were received in Ethiopia, affecting the river and floods. 300 was reported in Uganda. South Sudan, we didn't have any report in terms of displaced person, but Sudan, we had 1,050 reported as displaced. Djibouti also we didn't have a report as well as Eritrea. In terms of measures that were taken, this again is aggregated from all the report received from the member states. Early warning issues were, I mean, issue of early warning was done uh, timely for the several member states as well as community sensitization. And then uh, relocation of, especially those who are affected with floods in Sudan and Ethiopia to safer ground. And in terms of response, at least there was some report on cash transfer, and some people were affected and also distribution of food and non-food items as well. And also there are some uh, underway activities on construction and recovery, especially those who are affected by floods. And in generally, there are some countries who had multi-sector approach in these um, measures, but uh, we still uh, encourage the effect. Julie, you are doing very bad in terms of time. Can you wind up, please? Uh, this is my last slide, Dr. Thanks. So multi-sector approach was one of the major uh, positive thing that was done by the countries during this season. And then monthly we encourage it to be done before, during and after a disaster. So just want to acknowledge the contribution of the 10th advisory committee of the member state under the DRM who made this report. Thank you, Dr.
Thank you, Julie. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just keep your eye on the chat box. Uh, if you have any questions so far, I've not seen any, but uh, you and your team expect any question uh, from the floor. Uh, the last uh, presentation uh, would be conflict. Uh, let's have uh, conflict. Taking the floor now, Hamoud. And uh, uh, I request you. Kiana to you, share for Yeah. Thank you. So this is the conflict sector uh, has, like it has been described before. We have uh, uh, in, uh, arranged this in the status and then the impact uh, the weather conditions had on security and conflict. So in areas where we had uh, above normal rainfall and uh, flooding and overflow of rivers, the status was as that it has led to the uh, destruction of farmland. In Ethiopia, for example, it has led to the 100 families moved. In South Sudan, um, there was at least 45,000 in uh, Ayod County. Fangi County was also 18,000. In Somalia, we had uh, uh, the two rivers, the uh, and uh, Marka District, uh, uh, families uh, people have uh, Osman you are not uh, very clear maybe you have an uh, internet issue you are breaking at least from my end um are you able to hear me now better is it better now yes uh, go ahead so Fiona, if you can just, I will come back to the impact on security and cover it once. If you can go back, I, I will just finish with the with the member states. Yes. So in also, just, just to the next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So in Uganda, there was also 2,700 people from 450 households who were affected by the above, room, uh, the above uh, normal rainfall and the flooding. So um, there was also flooding, uh, high water volume in uh, lakes and swamps. Um, so we can go back, Fiona, so that I can discuss a little bit more on the impact on security. Just go to the first slide, please. That's the first slide. Yes. Um, so there was loss of livelihood in South Sudan as a result of the weather conditions and the weather condition resulting to the migration of victims of floods to severe areas which were already inhabited by the host communities. And from the conflict angle, this is normally going to increase uh, hostilities among uh, communities living there. On to the next slide, please. Um, still on the impact on security, there was tension and escalation of conflict between the military who are enforcing the fisheries regulations and communities. And uh, it also led to the death of one Marine officer who was enforcing the rules uh, put in place. To the next slide, please. So uh, in circumstances where there was delayed of uh, above, below rather average rainfall and uh, dwindling pasture and water in major, all the member states, there was uh, in Kenya, for example, there were 20 asal counties uh, experiencing drought stress. Uh, the pastoralists from Kenya have also migrated to Uganda in search of uh, the basic commodity of uh, pasture and water. In Somalia, there was a delay of at least three to four weeks of the onset of the GU season. And in Uganda, there was also resource stress. What this had on the impact on security is that uh, it led to rapes and thefts between South Sudan and Kenya, for example, and also Ethiopia, Kenya and also Uganda, Kenya uh, cases were also reported of deaths and raids. In Somalia, the dwindling resources have resulted in conflict uh, between farmers and herders, such as clan conflict in Bokwame and Burtinle region of Butlan. In Uganda, 
the pastoral communities also continued to read each other, leading to, um, yes, uh, to deaths and continued cycle of violence. On to the next slide, please. So, so there was also uh, armyworm reported in all Oreda in uh, of Ethiopia, for example, affecting uh, over 3,000 people, um, over 3,000 hectares of maize, rather, sorry. And this, in terms of security, it has led, uh, or we're anticipating, that uh, there will be the rural uh, uh, urban migration, uh, you know, as a result of these uh, uh, issues. To the next slide. So the June, July, August period is normal rice season. Uh, the status is that uh, in Pokot of, uh, of Uganda and Kenya, they are jointly grazing in terms of positivity uh, with the Pian and uh, Nabalatuk district. Pokot are also currently grazing. There's also the Pokot from Kenya who are jointly grazing with the Pian. In terms of security, it has uh, this managed, managed competition of resources, reducing clashes between the, the Pokot of Uganda and Kenya, for example. It also boosted local small scale trade and exchange improving communal relations and coexistence. It also lead to increased food security, thus reducing cases of stealing among the, uh, the herders. To the next slide, please. So the, in terms of implementation and impact of climate services and advisories in uh, the June, July, August, uh, Ethiopia, South Sudan and Uganda, there was the dissemination of information to relevant offices and partners in Ethiopia, for example, 50 households from Afar moved from the river banks. In Sudan, there was a food aid to households and households item rather, and items uh, distributed. In Kenya, there was a facilitation of intra and inter communities. There was also coordination of peace and security. The, it, there was also uh, the National Drought Management Authority implementing a total of 19 micro projects in 13 counties, mainly from the ASALs. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm ready for any clarification that has to be sought. My colleagues uh, from the conflict uh, sector are also available. We will be ready to respond to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Hamoud, uh, uh, for the well, pre uh, well presented uh, uh, sector of, of conflict. Indeed, we appreciate you coming in and uh, you've done very good work uh, today. And thanks to the team from the conflict and other sectors. I see we have uh, some few minutes to wrap up this session. I just want us to uh, quickly uh, look at uh, some of the questions that may have not been answered. I'm glad that uh, if you are on the chat box, most of the questions have been answered very well. Um, probably if I could uh, uh, just remind uh, um, Caroline, there was one from uh, Cara that uh, what is the relationship between COVID-19 and the price? Uh, maybe you answered it. I saw you answered it. It's the issue of uh, supply and demand and uh, probably with restrictions as you have said. So I think uh, you have nothing more to add on that. Thank you, Caroline. But let's look at uh, the water and energy sector. A uh, good debate going on about lake levels. Thanks, Dr. Hamed. You have correctly indicated that the rising level is uh, due to rising lake levels, uh, particularly Lake Victoria. But uh, Ambani is really interested to see that uh, Lake Tanganyika will also rise, going by the same argument. Uh, do you have anything to say on this, uh, Dr. Hassan? Are we expecting Lake Tanganyika to rise, or the rivers feeding to this lake are not uh, on the rainy catchment uh, side? probably could uh, come in and say something about Dr. Kanyika. Dr. Hassan. Or Iqbal, whoever is ready, or any water sector member. Is the argument on the lake uh, level rise valid for Tanganyika? Are we expecting it to rise? Iqbal. You want to answer that? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, because the next okay. season for October, November, December is a dry season for Burundi. So the lake uh, sh should be uh, the drop in the lake level. 
so it will not be increased in the level. Dr. Mohammed also want to add something. Can you unmute uh, Dr. Hassan to add? If there is anything to add, but I can. Yeah, thanks, uh, yeah. Dr. Philip. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's not very easy to tell now whether the lake levels will go down. I think part of the catchment to Lake Tanganyika also is beyond the uh, Greater Horn of Africa. So it is in Zambia as well as in the DR Congo. So we are trying to set up models to understand that. But at this juncture, I think it's difficult. All I can say is over the dry season, the JJA uh, season has been the dry season for the catchment. So that's why we have seen a, a reduction in the lake level, but it's not yet out of the woods. The levels are still high. So it's likely it can go either way, depending on the rainfall performance in the OND. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hassan, for, for, for that uh, uh, answer. Uh, I think there was an issue with the uh, Prosopis Juliflora uh, uh, from Diwali, Abdi. And uh, Eugene, you correctly said that uh, you don't have data. Uh, on invasive species, and rather you are referring uh, Abdi to Ekpald. I'm not sure you need to be a certain where this data can be, because uh, there is a need to know uh, this rapid expansion. There is need to have a data. Eugene, uh, is it only Ekpald or any other satellite observations can be used? Do you have uh, data? Is something of concern? If you could say something on this. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe yes. also Caroline could add us something after Eugene. Yes, uh, the, to the team. Yes, Philip. Yeah, we don't have uh, data for now for for prosopis or other invasive species, uh, but I know Ikpad was working on that, especially on the Kalamoja and the uh, other areas. That's why I was referring him to to Ikpad, the team of uh, Eva and the others. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we are well uh, done. I don't see any other burning question from the chat box. Uh, don't see any other. So uh, this has been a, a very good session. I think uh, we can save some minutes for the next session because uh, there could be more uh, from other session. Otherwise, thank you very much presenter. I think Fiona, you did a good work for uh, moderating the number of slides. We have done very well in terms of time. And I want to thank everybody uh, for uh, doing a good job. And uh, wherever you are, can you just clap for yourself online? <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, without uh, wasting much time, I hand over to uh, Fiona. Fiona, take the floor. Great, great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Philip. Um, we, we do still, you know, we're very good on time because of our early start. So please do continue to put your questions in the chat box and we can, um, you know, ask the, the presenters to be checking the chat box to see if there's questions um, and, and respond to them there. And we will have more time later for <coughs> plenary level, um, you know, asking sectors to to respond, uh, but maybe before we move to the next session, just to ask if any of the sector uh, present presenters um, would like to respond to any questions you've seen in the chat box or reinforce any message um, that people have been asking about. Um, just very quickly, any sectors, just open your mic and uh, and also Anthony for that matter, because Anthony shared uh, from the climatological aspect. Um, so if any of you would like to just, um, you know, respond to any of the things that have come up, um, just open your mic now and go ahead. So, it's hard to see, um, was that Zachary? Um, okay, I'm not seeing any, not seeing anyone opening their mic. So, um, 
question here if we can share copies of presentations with participants. Um, yes, <clears throat> perhaps. Um, can I ask those of you who've presented um, that you could um, try to upload into the chat? Um, but I would especially ask for the next session. We are now going to go into session three. Um, I'll hand over to the moderator in a moment. Um, the next session is all about the coming season. And so with um, Stefan and Zudu, after, after you've presented, it would be very nice if you could upload your presentations into the chat, um, because those are, I think, session three presentations are really the most important information that many of us are here for um, on where, you know, where we are headed over the coming season. Um, and the Anthony and the sectors, if you're able to upload yours in the chat, that would be great as well. Um, Otherwise, um, let's move on now and we move into session three and I will hand over to Masilin to moderate for us. Over to you, Masilin. Thank you, Fiona. Good morning, everyone. We are now moving on to section three of our program. So in this session, we'll focus on the October to December seasonal forecast. Uh, first up, we'll have Dr. Stefan Lanes from the Met Office, and he will present on the current state of global climate system. Over to you, Dr. Stefan. Thank you, Mazelin. I'm actually having difficulties sharing my PowerPoint presentation, unfortunately. Um, Leonard, could you give Stefan the right to share screen? Is it a share screen issue? I can, I can share screen, but I'm not able to share my PowerPoint at all. Okay, so just let me... Um, can someone, can someone I, take over, yeah. please? Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry uh, about that. The, um, it's the one you shared yesterday, yeah? It's still fine? Yes, thank yeah. you. Okay, coming up in a moment. I'm just opening it here. Ah. It's taking a while to open on, here we go. Uh -huh. Okay. It says confer on the top, is that right? Uh, yes, I suspect, I suspect so. Okay, here we go. That's, that's right. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Right. Over to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, good morning, everyone, and, and very warm greetings from the UK Met Office. Uh, this is the current state of the global climate system. Next slide, please. Uh, in this presentation, I will cover the continued evidence for global warming and briefly discuss the reasons for monitoring the state of the global climate and then present both the current and projected status of two well-known drivers of East African seasonal variability, the El Nino Southern Oscillation and the Indian Ocean Dipole. Next slide, please. The last few decades have seen large increases in the global average temperature. The left figure here shows the temperature anomaly defined as the difference between the temperature in any year with respect to the 1850 to 1900 average. Temperatures have been rising rapidly since 1975 with global values now roughly 1.3 degrees higher than the pre-industrial period. 2020 was the warmest or second warmest year on record, depending on the data set used. And this is even though the second half of the year experienced La Nina conditions, which typically results in the cooling of the atmosphere due to the upwelling of cold ocean water in the East Pacific. La Nina's presence continued uh, during the first half of 2021, but there's still a 99% confidence of 2021 being in the top 10 warmest ever years globally. The figure on the right shows the measured global temperatures for July 2021, which turned out to be the warmest July on record. And in fact, it was the hottest month ever recorded on Earth. Next slide, please. 
Unpredictable variability in the weather and climate system termed chaos makes it difficult to produce accurate forecasts with long lead times. However, drivers of the global climate, such as the large scale fluctuations in sea surface temperatures, which I'll now refer to as SSTs, can influence the seasonal and interannual variability in rainfall for certain locations, making it easier for us to predict whether rainfall will be above or below average. The drivers with the largest influence on East African rainfall are the ENSO in the Pacific, characterised by the El Nino and La Nina events, and the intermediate ENSO neutral phase, and the Indian Ocean Dipolar IOD. If you could just click once, please, to change the slide a little. They can help tilt the distribution of outcomes towards wet or dry, depending on the particular driver and season. It's very important to note that knowing the status of these drivers, which we'll look at now, can give us some idea as to the most likely conditions over a season. They do not fully determine a season's outcome. And there are other factors that must be considered. And this is where dynamical climate models from the global producing centres are useful as they consider a wide array of contributing atmospheric processes and not just sea surface temperatures. Next slide, please. Let's start by looking at the current observed conditions via the tropical SST anomalies. As you can see from the left-hand figure, over the last month, SSTs have been below average over the east and central tropical Pacific and slightly above average in the West. The current status of ENSO is neutral, although ENSO indices are currently negative. Click to load the right hand side of the slide, please. The figure on the right shows the recent changes in SSTs uh, during late July and early August, indicating a slight cooling across the East Tropical Pacific, but a warming in the West. And if we plot the time evolution of the Pacific SST anomaly, we can see it's been generally cooling since the start of July, indicating a potential return to a La Nina in the coming months. Next slide, please. This figure from the Copernicus Climate Change Service shows the historical SST anomaly over the commonly used Nino 3.4 region, as well as the predicted values, which are in red, from multiple global producing centre dynamical models, such as the ECMWF and the UK Met Office. You'll see that the majority of models show, for the OND season, a predicted cooling with respect to the July anomaly. During OND, models from the C3S seasonal forecast indicate a very high chance of La Nina conditions, as shown by the number of red model runs that are below the negative 0.5 degree threshold. It's worth noting that a large number of model runs still predict a neutral ENSO for this period. Click, please. Probabilities from the Climate Prediction Centre also indicate probabilities of La Nina occurring to be around 60 to 70 percent. So a La Nina event over OND does mean a preference for drier conditions over East Africa for the upcoming season. Next slide, please. Like the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean also exhibits fluctuations of sea surface temperatures on interannual timescales. And this variability can be quantified in terms of the Indian Ocean Dipole Index or the IOD. And this variability, um, it's calculated by subtracting the SST anomaly in the East Indian Ocean from the anomaly in the West. The IOD has shown good skill in predicting seasonal rainfall over East Africa for OND season. Therefore, monitoring its status can provide a clue as to the upcoming conditions. Next slide, please. On the left, I show the July uh, to August SST anomaly figure again, but now focusing on the Indian Ocean. The current pattern of warm east and cool west is resulting in a negative phase of the IOD. A negative IOD has been linked to drier than average conditions across the Greater Horn region for the OND season. But will a negative IOD persist into the season itself? Well, the right hand figure here shows the predicted IOD values in October and December for selected models, including the UK Met Office and ECMWF, with the average of these five models shown via the mean. In October, all but one model predicts a negative IOD, but by December, all models shown here indicate a return to IOD neutral, showing a weakening of IOD. Hence, the currently negative IOD conditions are expected to remain for at least the first part of the season. Next slide, please. 
In summary, we provided continued evidence of global warming with the surprising near record global temperatures of 2020 occurring despite the cooling influence of La Nina in the second part of the year. The latest data shows that we are experiencing ENSO neutral conditions, but models indicate La Nina conditions are expected to return over the OND season. La Nina in OND signifies a preference for below average rainfall or drier conditions. IOD has an influence on OND. It's currently in a negative phase and is predicted to be negative for much of the coming season. And a negative IOD over OND also means a preference for below average rainfall. This is the current and predicted states of the global climate system and ICPAC's Dr. Zudu will now present the consolidated forecast with details of the processing of GPC models by ICPAC and NMHS representatives. If you have any questions, my colleagues and I will be happy to answer them in the chat. Thank you very much. Please all stay safe in the season ahead and over to you, Dr. Zudu. Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you, Mazalyn. Thank you, Dr. Stefan, for the very clear presentation. So for participants, if you have questions, please send them through the chat box. Um, next up, we'll have Dr. Zodu, who will present on the OND seasonal forecast. Over to you, Dr. Zodu. Thank you very much. I was unable to upload. Um, let me, yes, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I will be um, talking about the seasonal forecast and I will start from um, the seasonal contribution and average for October, November, December, and this contribution to the annual total. Um, so uh, most of the rainfall season exceeding 500 millimeter is primarily in the western parts of the region as well as um, western Ethiopia and central and western Kenya. Uh, however, this um, uh, contribution from these regions is uh, quite uh, small or is less than 40 percent. On the other hand, towards the east, although these regions uh, get um, more than uh, um, but between 10 to um, 300 millimeter, their contribution is quite significant, uh, reaching up to 70% in uh, Eastern Kenya, Ethiopia, and uh, um, the Red Sea states. Uh, to identify analog years, uh, we use currently observed sea surface temperature shown on the top left. Um, and assess how good is the correspondence in the past years uh, with, for the Indian Ocean. We show it here. Uh, uh, so um, generally the in, for Indian Ocean basin, there is uh, good correspondence between the observed and uh, uh, 2016. Uh, for Central Pacific um, SSTs, um, um, we are comparing the evolution of sea surface temperature uh, from last November to the ne next January. And uh, the most, uh, the closest in terms of correlation and um, in terms of having the lowest bias are 2001 and 1996. So overall, the, the closest years that show some characteristic with the predicted uh, season are 2006, 2010, and 2001. Uh, the objective forecast, however, uses uh, nine global climate model outputs and statistically recalibrate them to um, correct for global effects, to account for global effects, and also for the local um, variations. We then average the two. Um, uh, between CPT and local regression to get the final forecast. So at any given location, the forecast will be will show only the dominant tercel category between the normal, below, and uh, above tercel categories. Overall, we can see that from Tanzania to um, Somalia, um, there is a generally a drier than average condition, 
with uh, increased probability for below normal rainfall in the cross-border areas of Kenya and uh, Somalia. Um, over Western Uganda and the parts of, uh, and also South Sudan, there is no significant uh, difference between the different categories. So we simply uh, label them at 33 points. So each of the other category are um, equally likely. In um, Somalia also, the Eastern Horn Coast areas, um, the probability pre uh, is expected to be normal to below normal at 35. So the difference between the adverb is still is quite close. Um, here we are showing the, the probability of accidents map, uh, which shows the, prob the probability of predicted rainfall exceeding a given threshold um, um, that can be applied for uh, any uh, application. So uh, the two plots on the right here show the probability of exceedance for 200 millimeter and 300 millimeter. And as we saw earlier, the Eastern half of the GHA um, have the maximum of 300 millimeter during the OND. Uh, to give it more context, so we compare this with the observed frequency of exceeding that same amount. In the top is for 200 millimeter and in the bottom right is for 300 millimeter. So what is shown is the departure, whether the predicted probability exceeded the observed fre frequency or not. So the blue color indicates the difference between the two, the frequency of observed frequency is higher than the predicted probability, meaning the regions in Kenya and also in Tanzania are likely to have a reduced chance of exceeding 200 millimeter during the OND season. On the other hand, um, parts of Southern Sudan have increased the probability, meaning the predicted probability is higher than the frequency of the observed frequency. So there is uh, increased the chance of uh, enhanced rainfall over some places, localities in, uh, in, the, in South Sudan. For 300 millimeter, we see um, some, some of the localities have uh, reduced the chance of exceeding 300 millimeter. In addition to this, we have shown here the um, standardized precipitation index, which my colleagues earlier presented for uh, the observation. Here we use uh, the predicted uh, precipitation for August to December and combine it with as needed with the observation prior to July, prior to August uh, from, uh, from January to July. So we did this uh, SAPI as a measure of drought index. Uh, for three month SAPI, for six months and 12 months SAPI. So shown here in the East have uh, areas that show um, um, a moderately dry conditions over the Eastern parts of uh, uh, Kenya, as well as parts of Kenya and uh, some localities. When we do the six month SAPI now, which, which also extend, include observation for July. Um, it brings out the area of um, moderately drier um, regions, which includes uh, Eastern Kenya here, um, parts of Ethiopia and Uganda. A 12 month SEPI, which is a cumulative trend of, we show a cumulative trend of droughts, um, show um, some parts of the region, especially Eastern Kenya, parts of Western Uganda, Ethiopia, have um, up to severely dry condition or severely dry um, droughts. On the other hand, on the northern half, um, just about 10 degree north, we see greens which indicate, um, which show or indicate the prevalence of excessively wet conditions in the north in the past uh, um, few months during the summer. Here we show the onset of the season. Uh, the predicted onset is based on uh, 43 uh, worth ensemble models, which were uh, produced by using um, a NOAA uh, climate model. 
Um, the average show the onset is in October, the first decade over northern and parts of uh, um, Eastern Ethiopia, then it increases to the second decade of October um, to central Somalia, to southern Ethiopia. In Kenya, the onset is um, after November. And um, in uh, Tanzania, then the onset is late in November. So um, basically for, 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 sorry, for Tanzania is later than late November. So generally for the season we are talking about for Tanzania is after late November. Compared to this, the average of uh, onset uh, um, for 30 years show um, very significant delay in the onset over the Eastern and Southern Somalia and also parts of the uh, Turkana, um, Karamoja area in general. Parts of um, um, uh, Somalia also has, Northern Somalia also has uh, the delayed onset. Some early onsets are indicated to Southern Sudan and the parts of Western Kenya. In terms of temperature, generally a warmer than average temperature was predicted uh, throughout the, um, the region. Uh, probability for warmer than average temperatures are highest um, in the east over a region extending from Kenya um, to um, Somalia, Ethiopia, and parts of Northeastern um, Sudan. Uh, just to, to uh, summarize, most parts of GHA are predicted to have um, higher likelihood for drier than average rainfall. Probabilities are enhanced, especially over Eastern Kenya and adjoining Somalia, where delayed on season onsets are indicated. Compared to the usual chances, the predicted probabilities of rainfall exceeding 200 millimeter and 300 millimeter are much enhanced over South Sudan, Northwestern Uganda, Southwestern Ethiopia. In contrast, predicted probabilities for exceeding this threshold are much lower than usual uh, over Eastern Kenya and Southern Tanzania, where uh, below normal rainfall is uh, predicted. Observer condition for January and prediction to end of December 2021 indicate continuing multi-season droughts conditions over Uganda, parts of Kenya, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Tanzania. Generally warmer than average temperature are pre predicted across the region. Um, lastly, just I will leave this one. Um, since we started the objective forecast in May 2019, uh, the top panel show all the uh, forecast provided at GACOV and the below the bottom uh, panel show all the corresponding observed precipitation um, that were analyzed using the tercile method, meaning by dividing the observation into three parts. So that is for you to assess. That is the advantage of objective uh, forecasting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zeudu, for the very clear presentation. So I see there are a number of questions in the chat and please continue posting your questions on the chat. Um, the first question is for Stefan. Uh, there is a question on if there are any updates on the Atlantic Dipole and its influence on the Western sector of IGAD. Stefan, if you can please unmute yourself. Leonard, if you can make sure Stefan and Zudu can unmute, as well as Marcelind, because they'll now be answering the questions. Um, Stefan, are you able to unmute? Uh, yes, Stefan can go ahead and unmute himself. Okay, and Zudu, you're also able to unmute, presumably. Yes, I am. Okay, Stefan, are you with us? Ah, he's having difficulties unmuting. I don't, could you unmute him? Um, let's see, hold on. Uh, 
Uh, yes, I've, uh, I've sent him an alert to unmute. Uh, he has texted. Okay, I've seen that. Yeah. Are you able now, Stefan? His co-host, so he can, it will be very yeah, easy for him. Uh, maybe he has a technical hardware issue. Unmuting. Yeah, maybe he has a hardware issue, or I don't know. Okay. Because he is co-host. That's right, very strange, because it worked fine for the presentation. Um, maybe Marceline, you could direct questions at Zudu for now, <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> and then we see if Stefan manages to solve his problem. He can jump in. Okay, so I see a question uh, on uh, with climate change. Do you think the use of analog years will still be useful? Yeah, yeah. Um, we actually do not um, uh, use or as input towards the objective forecast at all. We only provide the analog because users requested for it. So, um, so to, to the, the um, um, just to, I wanted to make that clear first. Uh, um, but, um, um, Please note that the analog years we are using are since 1980s, the recent past, and there has been significant changes in the mean. However, we are still using the same mean, um, 91 to, to, to 2020. So we don't use analog in the objective forecast. We provide it for the users because it is requested, but Normally we use the recent climate for as a mean, as a climatological mean. Thank you. Am I mute or am I hurt? Uh, Marceline, are, are you mute? Oh, it's Marceline. Uh, is Marceline still here? Um, I'm not sure what's happened to Marceline. Um, thank uh, you, Zudu. You seem to have right. lost her. Right. Okay. So no problem. And I'm just thinking if Stefan still has problems, Leonard, you could give Richard Graham and Andrew Coleman um, right to open their mics. And um, maybe they would also be able to help with the questions that were directed to Stefan. Um, so, yes, I've done that today, Fiona. Okay, great, thanks. Um, but maybe still with um, still with Zudu, uh, Abebe is also congratulating you. It's breaking news for the coming season. The introduction of the drought forecast is good. The introduction is good. The forecast is not so good, I think. <laughs> yes. that. Yeah. Um, but yes, um, very clear from both presenters that we are heading to lower than normal um, rainfall, um, which isn't so great. Um, so I don't know, Richard, Andrew, Stefan, are any of you able to speak? Uh, maybe we can just try and... and see whether we can hear you. Um, I can speak. Can you uh -huh. hear me? Richard? Okay, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Andrew, what about you? And Stefan, back to you. Can you? Are you? It's very strange. Um, Andrew also is not. saying he cannot Hello? unmute. I just heard you though, Andrew. Yeah, I can unmute yeah. now. Uh, yeah, that's great. Okay. Now. Stefan, do you want to try again? Otherwise, I'm going to, to ask uh, Richard and Andrew to um, answer your questions. Um, so let me um, let me read a few of them out. Um, so we had questions from Oliver around updates on the Atlantic dipole and its influence on the western sector of IGAD and any early indications so another question any early indications for MAM 2022 based on persistence of the 
current climate drivers or lack of persistence, maybe in the sense of the IOD. Um, and then another question, if there's any documented relationship or interaction between ENSO and IOD. Um, so maybe you could take any and all of those. Can I start? Yes, please. Hello, yeah. Uh, on the issue of the March, April, May, I think one thing to note firstly is that the relationship between ENSO and rainfall is not does not stay the same, but uh, the relationship kind of much weaker. If, and there is some evidence actually that ENSO can actually rainfall relationship could even be reversed in some March, April, May season. So you can't assume that uh, even if the La Nina persisted, that you'd actually get another dry season. Uh, the, the moment of forecasts are that the uh, ENSO signal will. Get, get back to, to neutral, i.e. the La Nina will come to an end. Uh, so IOD is a bit less predictable at that time scale. But uh, at the moment, we can't really say a lot about March, April, May season. Great. Okay. As for the Atlantic, I haven't looked very, very closely recently. Uh, it's not the biggest player for the uh, IOD season. I wouldn't expect it to. There are... I've seen some predictions that might suggest it might conflict with the IOD, but uh, I, I think this, the strong signals for this season are quite clearly coming from the Indian Ocean and from the Pacific. I don't think there's anything which is going to really counter that. But there is always a the forecast, there's a probability forecast, so there is always a chance, even if we go 50% chance or dry, there's still another 50% chance it'll be average or wet. So we should remember that we're not going 100% forecast for uh, dry anyway. Okay. Great, thanks, thanks. There's a, a similar question about if there's any significance of Madagascar channel cooling to seasonal performance of OND 2021. Uh, Again, this is an issue which should be in the probability forecast. I can't comment exactly on what's happening, but uh, as I said, the, the models and the dynamic and statistical should pick that up if it's, if it's there. There's no, I, I don't see any sign of anything there, uh, but obviously something perhaps very further investigation. But, but again, I don't think there's anything to suggest it would have a big influence on the forecast, but it's up to you. I recommend further work is done. Right, great. And then another one, similar as well. Um, Realise it. So between a connection between IOD and ENSO through the conveyor ocean belt internal ocean flow and what that would mean for East Africa region rainfall. Uh, uh, again, this is a topic which has been studied. There's different opinions in the scientific community about how much IOD and ENSO are related. Some people even think that IOD is not independent of ENSO. I think it's now pretty established that IOD is an independent phenomenon, but uh, IOD a lot of the time is linked to ENSO and it's still being studied. My colleague in the UK, David McLeod, has been written an interesting paper on this topic, which I recommend some anybody should read if uh, they want to look at the late, some of the latest work on this issue, which is ongoing. Is that the TTK's paper that Stefan mentioned in the chat? Yeah, I think TTK's paper, I recommend that too, but there's also a paper right. on the Tau de Tau. Okay, okay. If you yeah. could maybe put something about that in the chat, yeah, then okay. people would be able to it. look it up. That would be great. Yeah, so Stefan actually was uh, mentioning TTK's paper in relation to seasonal time scales in relation to what the um, PDO, I'm not sure what PDO is, but apparently PDO has been mentioned in the AR6 report um, influencing rainfall over the region at decadal time scale. Any comments at seasonal scale? And Stefan mentioned that's very complicated. TTK's paper would be good, but perhaps um, you could tell us a little bit about the PDO influence at decadal and then seasonal timescale. 
Yeah. Well, PTO is really a low frequency sort of decadal version of Venso, and it's quite okay, quite tied up with Venso. So I think I guess the theory is that if you get a, a strong PTO event, you sort of a continual amount of how the normal number of La Ninas or El Ninas going on. For example, back in the early 2000s, we have a well, we have quite a few La Ninas in a row, and a, a strong negative PDO event, which is also quite associated with a lot of quite a few droughts. Uh, again, it's something that requires further work and further study. Uh, I, think, I think it's it's worth well. It, Possibly has some relationship with the, with the paradox and known between the climate change forecasts, where they predict a wetter, a wetter Great Horn of Africa with uh, climate change, and also the observed uh, dry, no, persistent of dry years in recent years. It's PDO could be an explanation, but it requires further study. Great, thanks, thanks. Um, so maybe a question to both uh, you and Zudu, um, to just building on what you just said, to what extent the forecasting that you're able to now do and knowing you know, forecasting is improving all the time, to what extent you are you know, able to factor in um, the shorter and longer term climate change projection And this is a question to any of you. Mm -hmm. Stefan, if uh, you can go ahead, but uh, so far uh, uh, we have not incorporated the, the um, cl any climate change uh, um, indicator in within uh, the forecast. Um, but there are some activities that can be done for um, uh, how the climate change affect uh, the seasonal forecast within uh, um, a season. Uh, I think that is some, it, it, it requires some kind of uh, research, right? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you. Um, so there's quite a few questions uh, while you're there, Zudu. There's quite a few questions around SPI. I see you've also been chatting a bit. Um, mm -hmm. But if you could maybe, um, because SPI is, is new and, um, you know, you've been congratulated on bringing that into the forecast, mm -hmm. maybe you could just explain it a bit more again. And then there's a question from Maureen about, are there forecast probabilities for SPI, especially three months SPI? Um, and you mentioned um, that there was a three, three month SPI for OND. Um, I think there was also six and 12 months, but maybe you could just, because that's something that's maybe not been in the, your presentations before, just spend a bit of time going over it again. Okay. Um, uh, uh, well, uh... So um, we have um, observed precipitation and also pre predicted precipitation. Um, the first thing that is done is to transform the time series of uh, uh, precipitation uh, uh, into a, um, uh, another prob um, um, distribution, which is generally a gamma distribution is used. Uh, the, the reason being uh, rainfall is not normally distributed. So after that transformation, then we can, uh, uh, um, it, um, it is normalized, standardized. Uh, so this standardization make it uh, uh, useful for, uh, um, for comparing the different, uh, uh, different climate. Um, so basically, uh, um, there are different time scale associated with uh, uh, um, with the SPI. Um, um, a one month um, SPI is probably more like uh, a percent of normal. Uh, 
but the SCPI is more appropriate because um, it takes uh, that uh, um, the statistical distribution is better represented uh, in the SCPI. Um, and um, um, it is used to monitoring the drought. Uh, it is used, uh, uh, three months SCPI, for example, is a good tool for monitoring the soil moisture. Um, 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 and um, a six months SCPI is good to, to, to see if there are some short term uh, um, reduction in precipitation, departure in precipitation that might not be captured within a very short time period. So as you increase um, the time scale, um, um, there are the processes that are affected by that time scale can be uh, um, identified. And also, um, as you increase the time scale, meaning um, six months, nine months, or 12 months SCPI, uh, it, you, that can be used to uh, show the cumulative trend of either wetness or um, um, dryness, uh, usually. Uh, and a good measure for actually a drought, if there are persistent drought. In terms of probability now, currently we used only for the ensemble mean, um, um, but it is definitely can, is, uh, we, uh, it can be done for in a, a probability uh, sense as well um, by using for individual uh, uh, models and then uh, computing probability. But precipitation, when we are transforming the precipitation into a gamma, uh, distribution by itself that we are expressing precipitation in terms of probabilities. So uh, probably Dr. Um, Graham uh, can come in there if I'm, if he's available. Richard, do you, you want to add? And Abebe, please put your question in the chat box. Um, Richard, do you want to add something? Uh, thank you, Fiona. Uh, sorry, I missed the very last bit of uh, Dr. Zudu's. Uh, what, what was there some specific thing you wanted me to comment on? Uh, no, 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 no. I, I was just asking if you have yeah. any any no, um, no, I, I, comments, I think, uh, please. I was just I, inviting you. Sorry for <laughs> catching you like that. I, <laughs> that's right. No worries. I, I think uh, you covered it uh, very well. So I, I, I don't really think I can add much to it. Uh, thank okay. you. Great, great, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions. Just to let everybody know, yes, we will put both presentations into the chat box as soon as we are able. Um, just stay, you know, don't leave the Zoom link. We will, they will be there. Um, yes. Yeah, I was just typing in the chat, but so now I got the air as it were. I, the, I, yes. I was typing something about the question regarding the extent to which climate change is taken into account. Um, and I, I just wanted to say that some of the models that are used in the forecast uh, do, do take account of the changing CO2 levels um, in the, because although they are run for the, the current forecast, some of the, the way the forecasts are interpreted uh, depends on how the models have performed over the last uh, 20 years or so. And so it increases in CO2 over that period are taken into account in some of the models used at least. And, um, and so those will have some influence on, on the forecast probabilities. Uh, and also, of course, it should be remembered that, you know, a prime impact of global warming, you know, we're often than hearing that the ocean takes up quite a lot of the uh, of the heat, and, uh, and and these come out in observations of the sea surface temperatures, and uh, all of the models um, are initialized with the sea surface temperatures, uh, and so <clears throat> that influence um, will indirectly come through into the into the forecast. So um, there are some what you might call uh, um, implicit ways in which climate change comes into the seasonal forecast process. Great, thanks Richard. And I'll also just read a, an answer from Stefan who's been busy 
posting in the chat box because he's muted. Sorry, Stefan. Um, but he's also saying, I think we'll need to start carefully addressing climate change influence on seasonal norms and extremes. And with regard to analog years, I would at least suggest we limit the range of acceptable comparable years to those most recent, such that we have a similar background global situation like temperature. And this would account for potential changes in teleconnections with increasing global temperatures due to climate change, which I think kind of just adds to what you just said as well, Richard. Um, there's another question from Adunias on this topic. Um, I'm thinking how we can have an insight on the trends of climate variability in the last decades in the member states. One of the challenges in the IPCC report is lack of evidence from this region, unlike Southern Africa, which has better evidence. Um, so he's suggesting research, research could be planned for this. Um, and is there, is there any comment from any of you? Um, uh, well, hopefully the climate change people will be comment on this one. Uh, this is something that they have worked on. Um, Dr. Philip, Dr. Sabiti. Yes, we can we uh, tackle that when I, I'll be giving presentation on uh, the report on the warming. So we can uh, tackle that uh, during that time. Okay, that's fine. Um, the last couple of questions to Zudu. Um, is it possible to predict the tendency of La Nina, like weak La Nina, strong or moderate, as of August, as of this month, August 2021? And another question also on the OND forecast from Herbert, his question was, there's a light blue legend labeled transition zone with probabilities of 30 to 40, and he was wondering what that means. I think um, these are for you, Zudu. Yes, uh, so in, on the first one, uh, so we monitor uh, from the monitoring of an um, um, SST is the, from the global centers. Um, they do provide for August also on a weekly basis, for example, the Bureau of, Me Bureau of Meteorology in South Australia. Uh, they provide uh, um, changes every week. Um, and SEP, NOAA, also they provide. So we only monitor uh, from their side. That requires uh, a global level um, um, capacity. Uh, regarding this, uh, the transition zone, uh, uh, as I indicated, uh, when, you, uh, when we uh, plotted um, area between um, a warmer and a colder, there must be something in, mid, in the middle, right? So that is what we uh, try to refer. Sometimes this middle zone, also a transition zone, can be um, a... Um, um, and um, uh, research research categories can also be taken like that. But it is just to show there is no abrupt change um, from one zone to the other. There is a transition area. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Zudu. Um, so we're coming to the end of this session now. Um, for those who want Zudu's presentation, he posted it at 11.15 a.m. If you go up the, scroll up the chat, you will find Zudu's presentation posted there. You can download it from there. He posted it at 11.15 a.m. Um, for Stefan's presentation, we will um, upload it um, shortly. Um, just seeing, yeah. Um, as Stefan says, he's going to upload it very shortly. So both presentations are there. Please do download them. Marceline did get herself back, um, but I felt, Marceline, um, maybe best to continue because we knew which questions had been answered and asked and so on. Um, sorry for your problem with connection, um, but I think we've, we've managed okay. And um, thank you for the facilitation until you ended up dropping off, that was great. 
Um, so thanks to Stefan and Zudu, um, really interesting, um, very interesting information for the coming season. And I know the OND, traditionally speaking, has been a bit easier to predict, especially when there's ENSO involved. So I guess there's a reasonably high confidence of what the forecast is saying, which is not very good news, but um, at least we, we have you know, solid information to take us forward. So next we will have um, a break for 10 minutes and we will be back at 11.40 to start again, um, 11.40 East Africa time. And we'll go into session four, which is now to hear from the sectors, um, what did they make of it? So yesterday the sectors deliberated on this forecast um, for several hours together with sector experts and um, from the different countries and from different organizations. Um, so each sector has prepared um, what they see as the implications of this forecast on their sector and the advisories they would suggest for action. So we'll come back at 11.40 exactly. So don't, don't go off the Zoom, just mute yourself, um, take a short break and come back and we will continue um, at exactly 11.40 for the next session. Um, Thank you all, and great to see so many participants here. We're up to 182 now. Um, and so stay where you are, and we will start again at 11.40. Thanks.
Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're going to start our GACOF 59 main meeting again. Um, you're all very welcome. Good to see you all here. Um, just to check you're here, would you like to give us a wave or a little ta-da, some reaction to show that you are back in the room? Um, thumbs up, whichever you like. Um, just to show sign of life. I can see Callistus is with us. Anyone else actually here? Um, just give us a thumbs up. Uh, I can see more, yeah, hands up. You can, um, if you put your hand up, also remember to lower it. I can see some thumbs up popping up here and there. Some rounds of applause, definitely rounds of applause. Great, I'm seeing that we are, we are not just, um, <clears throat> you know, black boxes on a screen. We are actually people behind here. <laughs> um, great. So welcome back um, and heads up to the sectors. Um, Leonard will give all the sector heads now the um, presenting rights, as well as, of course, our facilitator. Our moderator for this session is Kenneth Mwangi. Um, and I will, without further ado, hand over to Ken to take us through the presentations from the sectors on what do we expect and what should we advise in relation to the October to December forecast. If you raise your hand to say hi again, um, that's the only reaction you have to, you have to actually lower it yourself. All the others, they automatically disappear. Um, but if you've raised your hand in order to say hi, just remember to lower it down again as well. Thanks. Um, great. So welcome, Ken, and uh, welcome everyone to session four. Uh, good late morning, everyone. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, it's very, a very exciting morning. And so we'll just go straight away to the session where we'll have the sectors now give us the information on what they discussed on yesterday to do with their forecast and the advisories that they anticipate. We'll start right on with agriculture by Oliver Kogay and the stakeholders uh, uh, presenting on behalf of the groups. So Oliver, uh, you can go on. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. I'm going to present on behalf of uh, all the stakeholders for the agriculture and food security, mainly on the implications and impacts of uh, and also response strategies for the coming season. So um, in terms of uh, general Im implication, uh, generally we've seen that there is uh, depressed rains. There is also issue of late onset, low probabilities exceeding 200 and 300, uh, contribution also from other non-climatic factors and all these present uh, actually poor prospects for the agricultural performance across the region. So in terms of some of the positive uh, sectoral impacts for the coming season, uh, actually there are good conditions for crop harvesting, particularly wheat, maize, sorghum, teff, etc., particularly in islands of Ethiopia, also in Western parts of Kenya. And this is uh, actually going to lead to reduction in uh, post harvest losses. There is also likelihood of reduced pests and diseases, including even desert locust in the region, which is a positive impact. Also, the predicted late onset uh, will enable farmers to get uh, enough time for land preparation. And uh, Dry conditions that are actually uh, predicted for the for the region will allow repairs of irrigation and other wa water harvesting infrastructure, and these are particularly across the irrigated areas. Um, in terms of uh, uh, negative uh, uh, sexual imp impacts for the season, uh, there is a high likelihood of poor crop uh, prospects due to mainly depressed rains. Uh, and also uh, water stress that might also lead to low soil moisture, and this might lead to below average harvest, um, increase in food prices, 
uh, likely increase in number of uh, households, uh, vulnerable households requiring need for expanding relief and other interventions in the region. Um, also the issue of uh, delayed onset, which is also predicted for the, for the region, will lead to delayed plant, planting, and this could actually impact negatively on the long cycle crops in parts of the region. Uh, also, the situation that is given uh, by the forecast may also trigger resource-based conflicts, which is a key driver of food insecurity in the region. Um, uh, also, generally poor food security situation, especially for the castle areas in the region. So in terms of uh, uh, measures and interventions, so what we, uh, we urge our governments and farmers, we advise them to promote planting of short season, early maturing and drought uh, tolerant varieties, and also to distribute uh, these type of seeds on time. And uh, we also encourage farmers to seek advice from extension officers and Minister of Agriculture in our various countries. We also, um, uh, governments and also uh, farmers are encouraged to promote uh, conservation agriculture practices, uh, practices like minimum tillage, mulching, ETC, and this is uh, actually in order to reduce evaporation and soil water loss. Uh, also uh, promote water harvesting practices uh, for supplementary irrigation in times of uh, water stress. Uh, also, uh, we encourage uh, farmers to expand irrigated areas and also rehabilitate irrigation infrastructure, governments to subsidize irrigation equipment, and also promote small-scale irrigation uh, technologies in the region. Uh, encourage also governments and partners to act early in response to the possible humanitarian crisis that the season uh, might uh, uh, present, uh, maybe particularly due to climatic, mainly due to climatic, and also consider some other non climatic factors. Uh, promote subsidies and also crops insurance cover to cushion farmers against these climatic shocks. And also, diversification is also another uh, measure um, to other livelihoods and uh, other income generating activities. And um, Households particularly are also asked to practice proper use of uh, available food stocks. Uh, and also the last one is, uh, which is also very key is to immediately disseminate this information to decision makers for early action. This early warning should be, uh, should be used for early action. So thank you very much. That's on behalf of the Agriculture and Food Security. So over to you, Chair. Thank you very much, Oliver, for the steady delivery. I will go right ahead uh, to the next sector. Uh, keep your questions on the chat as much as possible. And then during the plenary, we'll come back and discuss some of them. So write as many and also the presenters keep on looking at the chat box so that you can answer as you do. Our next presentation, Livestock and Rangelands. Uh, good morning, Kenneth. Thank you. Um, can I have my presentation, please? Uh, Fiona, you have the yeah. presentation? Yeah, yeah. Just hold on while I get it up. Um, just opening it now. Here we go. Okay. There you go. It's coming, I guess. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, I would like to thank uh, all those that participated in this uh, from the member states. Um, uh, the previous slide and this one basically summarizes how the livestock sector looks within the next um, um, few months. Uh, we have not had a, a previous good season, um, and we are going into yet another poor season, uh, particularly for the uh, for the pastoral communities within the region. Uh, with a forecast of uh, average rainfall to below average in most parts of the Horn of Africa, 
Um, this is a major threat to the livestock sectors. And we are looking out at areas of interest in Kenya, the Northeastern counties, including Trukana County are of concern to us. In Uganda, um, we need close monitoring of the seasonal performance um, and basically preservation of feed since they had uh, a good uh, JJS, but um, the current forecast is indeterminate, so it can go either way. So it needs uh, very close performance. In Ethiopia, um, we have grave concerns about Somali region and Burana zone, again, because we are already on uh, high alert within these areas. And so this need close monitoring and strategic uh, prepositioning for support to the pastoral communities. Um, uh, just to mention that in Kenya already, we had, uh, as at uh, one week ago, 10 counties that were already in the red. And this is going to just uh, make the situation worse because um, uh, we're expecting below normal rainfall and that is October, November, December. And we know we do not have rain again in January and February. So we have a long day for the livestock sector ahead. Uh, also desert locusts, uh, since there's still some, just st uh, stay with me on that slide for, since there's still some desert locusts in Ethiopia, Djibouti and Somalia, this need to be monitored and controlled because then they uh, are a threat to the uh, pastures uh, in case they multiply. We expect general uh, movements of animals and, and, and pastoralists in and out of their countries and within the countries, and this may give rise to conflicts. Um, so generally we are saying very close monitoring of performance of the current season because we still have a month or so to go and the upcoming season over the region is, uh, is recommended and just to ensure that we have supplementary feed and water for the livestock. Uh, for the country slides next, I will quickly go through because I think basically if we look at the slides, we see all uh, more negative um, impact as opposed to any positive impacts. For example, you can see in Djibouti, we do not have any positive impacts of the season, but uh, of course uh, the pastoralists will enjoy um, uh, sale of their products because of the, re the raising of the, um, of the COVID restrictions and the usual measures that we normally advise for a season like this, uh, basically to just continue with surveillance of animal diseases. Let's move to Ethiopia, please. Uh, in Ethiopia, as I have mentioned, um, there's below normal uh, and so of concern is Borana zone and Somali region. Um, uh, most of the country is going into crop harvesting season and therefore not of concern, but these two are to be watched. Um, and uh, so of course, supplementary feeding water is recommended for Ethiopia. Um, next. Kenya, again, we see not uh, much positive impacts. Uh, uh, and as we've said, uh, we expect deterioration of animal body conditions. Um, uh, what we are actually advising for Kenya and particularly in cluster one or otherwise known as Karamoja region uh, cluster is the implementation of the MOU that exists within that cluster by sensitizing of the communities on what they're expected to honor within that MOU because we expect to see a lot of movements between Kenya, Uganda, uh, Ethiopia, Uganda, and South Sudan and Uganda. Um, what we have seen in the previous season that the Kenya Meat Commission did a good job in um, off-taking and this was able to push on the farmers because they are offering better prices for the animals. So we are recommending a strategic off-take by KMC so that uh, the animals are not uh, affected because we think we have another five months of dryness in this region. Uh, next. Um, again, in Sudan, um, this is not their season. Um, so uh, we expect that animals will be moving towards South Sudan and there would be a lot of crowding in watering points and inadequate water. And this might give rise to diseases, uh, disease sharing, and therefore uh, we are advising for disease control. Um, and especially for those notifiable diseases, the pneumonias and foot and mouth disease. Next. Uh, for Somalia, again, um, they have concerns about pasture because already there's deterioration of pasture. So we expect that to uh, deteriorate further. And of course um, that could lead to uh, loss of animals. So we are recommending that they prepare to implement suitable plans to cushion the pastoral communities.
within Somalia. Next. Um, again, Sudan, um, the only positive impacts are expected in the lowlands where there might be a good pasture because they've had a good JJS. So we expect that uh, there will be movement of pastoralists from the highlands to the lowlands. And this, uh, even in this current season, as they were moving upward, there was um, <clears throat> a bit of conflict. And so we expect this to happen. Uh, again, as I mentioned, this forms part of the cluster. One, so implementation of uh, existing MOU is uh, recommended. Next. Uh, Uganda, the, the forecast is indeterminate, uh, but we are recommending that uh, because of JJS performance was good, that uh, whatever pasture has been uh, uh, grown in this season should be used strategically and stored well. So uh, in, in preparation to uh, not very certain uh, forecast. Um, and then we have about a minute. Okay, then of course peaceful negotiation over water and grazing droughts as they expect to remove pastoralists from the communities. Next. Um, uh, one of the suggestions from the group was that uh, what we have been given in the forecast, including the onset, the, the analog years, the, all those products that they would give us in his, his presentation, uh, if we look at that vis-a-vis -vis the time that we have to digest that and use that to generate um, advisories is very short. And so we're trying to suggest that maybe there may be a timeline that we can get the forecast and allow the users enough time to interact with these products so that they can make uh, relevant inferences uh, with regard to the sector. I think that is all from the livestock sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline, right on time. Uh, we keep the questions coming participants, we just go right to the next sector, where we'll go to environment and forestry. Uh, in the meantime, the, uh, could you please have Hamoud, who is presenting on conflict, identify himself. I think you shared the, your link with many people, so we have a uh, duplication of names here. So please uh, send a chat to me directly. Thank you. Environment and forestry, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kenneth. So on behalf of Eugene and on behalf of the member states who were present during the, the environment and forestry session yesterday, I will present the advisor, the impacts and advisories for the upcoming seasons. So we had um, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Uganda present during our sector meeting. Uh, when it comes to positive sectoral impacts, uh, we also do not, did not identify a lot of positive uh, impacts, but we had good vegetation and forest productivity in transition zones in South Sudan and Ethiopia, and then uh, decrease in water levels in flooded areas. So this came from South Sudan uh, because they've experienced a lot of flooding. So with the reduced um, um, rainfall next season, it's expected that these areas will be able to dry up in terms of the negative sectoral impacts for OND, uh, depressed uh, growth rates of trees already planted in both natural and commercial plantation areas. So this came from the forestry sector, and this is uh, relevant for Ethiopia, Kenya, South Sudan, and Uganda. Uh, there's also natural regeneration of arid lands and vegetation will be reduced. Uh, this is uh, from Kenya deforestation and vegetation degradation for alternative livelihoods. Uh, because of the expected um, food reduction in food production, we are expecting that uh, deforestation and vegetation degradation uh, will become uh, increased because people will be looking for alternative livelihood um, uh, sources. Uh, this is for Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, there's also increased cost of forestry production. This was reported by Uganda. Uh, increased incidence of fires and their associated environmental consequences, including pollution and threats to biodiversity, applies to Kenya, Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Uganda. Reduced availability of water and pasture for both wildlife and livestock, as also reported by the livestock um, 
co-production session. And then uh, we are expecting increased human wildlife conflict. So for Kenya, for example, this is already happening uh, due to dry conditions over, for example, Savo and Chulu national parks. And based on the OND focus, then this is expected to increase as well because then animals, wildlife are moving into um, private, either private, uh, private uh, reserves or also into farmlands as well to find uh, forage. Uh, so in terms of the key response missions and advisories that were identified, uh, promote fire management practices, uh, practices, and this include fire cut lines, digging fire cut lines, creating fire breaks and early warning because we foresee a situation where we will, the incidences of fire will continue to increase. Uh, this is for Kenya, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Uganda. There's also promote uh, forage and pasture management, and this could be through rotational grazing, also alternate, alternate offering alternative feed. This is for Kenya and Ethiopia, provide water for wildlife and livestock. So construction of water points or filling up existing water points or water troughs uh, for Kenya, South Sudan and Tanzania. Uh, there's also mobilized resources for human wildlife conflict management because we foresee that this will increase uh, Kenya and Tanzania. These uh, plant uh, moisture stress resistant varieties of trees, so drought is resistant variety of trees for any planting that is uh, foreseen to happen uh, between now and uh, end of the year. Improve on drought support uh, livelihoods uh, by providing food to most affected communities. And lastly, we're looking at promote land management or landscape restoration for areas affected by either floods or drought or uh, burnt areas as well. And then uh, finally, we are saying uh, enhanced capacity building and information dissemination. So we are talking about the patrol officers in the protected areas and uh, also um, livestock officers as well, so that they're able to disseminate uh, information regarding what are the best practices given the upcoming, uh, the state of the upcoming season. Uh, that is all, Kenneth, from the environment and forestry sector. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you very much. That was uh, clear and concise. Uh, please convert your uh, slides to PDF at some point and upload them in the chat to be able to do that. I'll call the DRM sector also to give their input for the season. So DRM, welcome. July, welcome. Thank you, Ken. And on behalf of the DRM team, I'll share a summary of what we discussed yesterday. And this group in two ways, they are the Northern sector and the South. So for the North, we have some impact summarized. And for a start, uh, from the Ethiopian Northern region, the reported that this next season will be good for their post-harvesting activities. But Somalia, the expected below normal rainfall will impact the next harvest season since they'll be looming, there's currently a looming drought conditions in the country. However, there's also a negative impact on water availability and this will be related to the drought expected in both uh, Somalia, Ethiopia uh, conflict also anticipated in the northern sector and as reported by the livestock sector, this will be related to the livestock migration and will be a conflict between the livestock uh, group and the farmers as well. And also in terms of the wildlife, the high temperature forecasted might also lead to heat wave and bushfire and South Sudan indicated that some of their wildlife might migrate to Kenya or Uganda. And so they propose some measures to be taken to avoid that. And uh, some of them are uh, adoption of irrigation or conservation of water strategies, especially for South Sudan. And also Ethiopia, I mean, the Southeastern part of Ethiopia. And also they recommended some uh, feed storage based from the, this ending season, just to be prepared for the dry season that is forecasted. And they'll also issue early one information to communities. And also for Somalia, the community-based initiative are encouraged to be supported by the local NGOs so that uh, they actually achieve 
the response that they're planning to do during the season. And then uh, smart climate agriculture is also encouraged for Somalia, but this should be, or rather be best advised by the agricultural sector in the country in terms of crops which are to be grown. And also awareness raising for communities and this- uh, Julie, if it would be more audible, move closer to your mic, please. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, for community awareness, South Sudan is planning to do some household level trainings. And just another slide on the equatorial and southern sector. We had Kenya, Uganda report that the expected below rainfall may also cause drought, but specifically on the north, eastern, eastern and coastal part of Kenya, but for Uganda it will be the Teso region, southwest and the Karamoja. However, the same countries also reported that there will be some flooding and landslide uh, which may occur in central and western Kenya and some pocket areas of Uganda. Again, conflict also came in uh, handy for Kenya, Uganda, and also a colleague from Tanzania reported the same. But this also will be between the pastoralists and the farmers as well. Uh, Uganda also indicated that in the next season, they expect the cases for COVID to be on the rise and the peak might be next month, September. So this will also be a challenge for them. And other productive sectors uh, within the region might be affected with the poor forecasted uh, rainfall or other season. In terms of advisory, uh, the agriculture sector in the countries, specifically for Kenya, advised are encouraged to advise on the type of crop to be grown during this uh, expected poor season. And again, water harvesting again is also advised, basically at the household level. And again, water tracking for the parcels and domestic use. Uh, Uganda appeal for WFP to help the Karamoja area in terms of food and non-food items, because this the group normally gets severe impact in terms of drought. And again, early warning issue, Uganda specifically indicated that next week they'll release the early warning information through their national television, and as well request the government to give them access on the relief fund so that they can respond to the next coming season. On the last slide, we summarize the general measures, and uh, there are at least four, or rather five. So one is the timely activation of the task, the task forces. And this can be within any member state that has the task force and able to respond. <clears throat> and also to encourage the community in terms of risk and dissemination of this information. Rather having a contingency plan to respond to drought and then promote early action in terms of this anticipated uh, impact of drought as well. And then you, encourage multi-agency and multi-hazard approach in terms of response. And this will help reduce the, the, the impact of these disasters and also promote innovative activities within the DRM offices in the member countries. So that's all for the DRM and thank you very much, Ken. Thank you very much, Judy. Uh, I can see some questions already coming in and uh, good engagement on the chat forum. Please keep it up. Uh, we'll call the right, uh, the next presenter right on, which is health sector. So health sector, welcome. <coughs> health sector, who's presenting for health sector? Uh, health sector was supposed to be Dr. David Gekongo. I don't know. Uh, okay, I can see the zone. Oh, excellent. Okay. Please launch the slideshow. Uh, just going to present your slideshow. Uh, Are you able to see me now? Yes, but it's still not on uh, full screen. You can see the slides, right? But uh, you can go into full presentation mode if you're able to. If not, yes. Is it any better? Yes, yes. Now you can start. Go on. All right. 
Um, this is the health team. Um, slides prepared by Paulino Ome, but presented by David Gekungo from Kenya Meteorological Department. We looked at country by country, and that is how the slides are arranged. And uh, looking at uh, Sudan, we see the key impacts of the forthcoming uh, season as uh, likely to have an increase in meningitis cases, as well as uh, allergens for bronchial asthma due to sandstorms that are expected. Cases of dengue fever are also expected to increase. And the advisory that is given for that particular country is uh, to enhance early detection, ensure that uh, there are control measures for Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, and also to enhance awareness. Looking at the next country, which is South Sudan, we expect an upsurge of malaria due to continuing flooding because a JJA, JJA was not too bad. And we also expect hepatitis E virus. And the, the advisory given for that is uh, to ensure assessment of uh, the relevant stocks uh, for management of the expected conditions and uh, also to, en to enhance or ensure that uh, key messages are passed on to the communities uh, so for pre adequate preparation. Kenya, we expect uh, nutritional conditions related to food deficits, especially in the north, north, northern parts of, and southeastern parts of uh, the country. Water wash diseases expected, such as uh, trachoma and scabies, increase in enteritic uh, diseases such as dysentery and diarrhea due to poor hygiene, and also heat stress and air pollution, especially in the arid and semi-arid lands. We also expect reduced uh, mosquito-borne diseases such as malaria and dengue fever due to the, to the expected uh, reduction in uh, rainfall and therefore the conditions that normally raise that will be reduced. And um, the advisory given for that is uh, to ensure that uh, we carry out vulnerability assessment from time to time, treatment where necessary in rising cases, and, and ensure availability of drinking water, especially in the dry areas, um, to ensure that uh, we reduce um, rather communication of risk where is necessary and also enhance public education. We go to Ethiopia, malaria may be exacerbated in areas with heavy rainfall where we expect uh, pockets of rainfall coupled with the uh, rising temperature that condition is conducive for malaria rises. Shortage of food and poor nutrition as a result of shortage of animal feeds that is expected. And uh, not notable there is that most of the communities are, are pastoralists. And there is also expectation of cholera and other diarrheal diseases associated with shortage of water. You will note that we talk about cholera when we expect uh, a lot of rainfall, excessive water flooding. And we also talk about the same when we have less because of hygiene standards that are affect, uh, that, that come to play in either way. And the advisory given for that is um, enhancement of health education, the importance of availing animal feeds where necessary, and also to improve water supply. Let's go to Burundi, where we find decrease in agricultural production with all its consequences on health, increase in acute malnutrition expected, decrease of vector-borne diseases like malaria, as has been mentioned about other places. And diarrheal diseases due to lack of during the JJA season, which was uh, dry in a uh, 
the, this particular country of uh, Burundi. And uh, for Burundi, the advisories that are given is uh, the importance to support low income households, uh, enhance malaria prevention, and observe water, sanitation, and hygiene. The acronym for, for that one was Uganda, malaria upsurge in some districts of Lango region, uh, for example, Amolata and uh, so on, Karamoja region. Uh, we expect uh, cholera outbreaks in some parts of Karamoja as uh, given there due to dry conditions, as I have explained, and cholera outbreaks in Kasese associated with the high rainfall expected in that particular zone. And the advisories uh, given for Uganda are uh, they to, to ensure early warning messages, uh, enhance malaria management, health education, routine net distribution, where we talk about net is for malaria, and enhanced surveillance. And lastly, we go to Somalia, where we expect serious shortage of water sources, both for human and animals, outbreaks of diarrhea and cholera, population displacement leading to more IDPs, serious shortage of food insecurity, and therefore malnutrition, and loss of uh, human... David, you have about a minute, so you can plan your time. Go on. Sorry? You have about a minute, so you can plan your time. Okay. I will be done within that one minute. The okay. advice given for that is a preventive measures uh, especially in areas uh, where we expect uh, acute water diseases. Case management is recommended. Nutrition interventions expect, uh, that is also recommended. Food distribution and water tracking. That is uh, important as advisories for Somalia and all the other places that are affected. I think I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David Gifungu, and uh, very well uh, laid out presentation on the impact and advisories. Uh, we'll go right to the next presenter uh, for the conflict. If uh, to be able to share your screen, please uh, raise, raise your hand so that uh, uh, the administrator can give you right to share. The presenter for conflict, since you have multiple uh, people under your name. And then, meantime, I think Fiona can be sharing this uh, the presentation for conflict. Uh, can, yes, please. I will do. Yeah, I'll share it. Just hold on. Okay. Yeah, we seem to have uh, five uh, instances. <laughs> so uh, we need to know who we are going to give the presenter rights to. Osman, please, uh, if you are the one to present uh, for the sector, raise please raise your hand. Uh, you, you need to raise your hand in the reactions area so that we can see which one you are. I've seen him. Okay, I've enabled. Excellent. So go ahead. I thank you, thank you uh, uh, Kim and team. So uh, let me from the onset uh, uh, acknowledge the contribution of uh, four member states from Uganda, Kenya, Ethiopia, and South Sudan for contributing to this report. Um, we appreciate the expertise on this. So with the expectance of uh, low rainfall, um, we will be anticipating for the October, November, uh, December, that there will be escalation of conflict in the Igad region. Uh, but this can be uh, really, uh, 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 measures can be put rather in place to fight this, uh, the escalation of conflict through the conduction of cross-border dialogues for the communities affected. We can also have the resource sharing, establishment of resource sharing committees uh, because mainly of the scarcity brought about by the low rainfall. 
and then we can also have uh, vaccination conducted jointly uh, through uh, mobile uh, activities. Next slide, please. So, um, like I said, uh, in terms of the negative uh, uh, predictions, of course, with the little resources, mainly of pasture and water, we will predict that we will have uh, an increased conflicts between the host communities and the migrants who have migrated due to scarcity of pasture and, uh, and uh, water, for example. Uh, we can also have conflicts between pastoralists and crop farmers animal disease is also expected to increase. And uh, we also expect people to move from regions to find employment. Uh, this is also a fact, uh, considering the fact that uh, we also expect lose of employment through this uh, low rainfall. Um, we can go to the next slide. So in terms of uh, advisories and recommendations, uh, we recommend the following, that uh, we can have early warning information shared with those who are affected, uh, but also cascading it to the low communities, local level communities will be beneficial so that they can get, uh, get prepare themselves uh, so that they can uh, not be caught unaware in this uh, uh, act. Also building capacities for communities and sensitizing them on the need to be be living uh, peacefully will also be one of the issues that we are putting forward. And then timely land preparation and early planting is one of the recommendations. We are also recommending that DRM uh, institutions can review their contingency plan based on this uh, OND focus. We can also have uh, uh, community awareness on the potential of the outbreak of diseases uh, in this time. Next uh, slide. So a contribution of this recommendation uh, suggests that uh, decision makers, including governments, can focus on rehabilitating uh, uh, rangeland. Government can also consider expanding uh, major irrigation canals. And the IGAD ICPAC uh, agency can work in research in the area and report to government with a specific uh, location that will be affected. Thank you. I think I'm done. Uh, like I've said, we are also ready for any clarification that is to be sought at the chat. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Hamoud, and for the concise presentation. There are already questions coming in in the chat that are linking your area and some of the comments that you made also on downscaling. So please engage the uh, participants in the chat also. Uh, we'll have now the water resources and energy. Uh, sector presenting. Uh, so the person presenting, please welcome. Mohammed Hassan. Welcome. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Am I clear? Am I audible? Yes, now you're audible. You can go right can you see my share. slide also? Very clear. Thank you, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to present on behalf of the water and energy sector and also thank all those who attended uh, yesterday's session where this summary uh, came from. Uh, on the positive note uh, for the upcoming season, first of all, uh, for those areas in the northern GHA, the countries that received uh, above average rainfall or good rainfall, uh, there will be you know, enhanced uh, water availability for use by both uh, the subsectors uh, that need water, be it livestock, irrigation, or hydropower. And these are mainly Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Sudan. Uh, further south, I think uh, due to the forecast of depressed rainfall, there's likelihood that uh, the lake levels will drop and this will reduce inundation, displacement of people, and the threat uh, to infrastructure around the lakes uh, regions. Uh, and also this is likely to improve livelihood because I think some of the businesses that were submerged and housing, and this may now be available and people may restart their businesses, particularly around Lake Victoria and I think uh, Lake Tanganyika. Uh, on a negative side, I think as many people have said, this is more on the negative side, particularly uh, because of the below average rainfall forecast. So water scarcity for both domestic uh, and irrigation, municipal as well as irrigation and 
uh, may be experiencing some of the basins that are forecasted to receive below average rainfall. Uh, this actually is uh, Eastern Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, Somalia, as well as in Tanzania. Uh, there is also, uh, because of the water scarcity and the dilution or impact, uh, water-related diseases are possible in these areas also, and uh, this may cause this, uh, the, the pollution may cause diseases. Uh, for the hydropower, I think there is also uh, chances that some of the basins that received below average in the last two seasons and are also forecasted for another uh, below average rainfall in the OND, uh, there is likelihood of reduced hydropower generation and uh, this uh, mainly particularly in Kenya and the Tana Basin as well as in Ethiopia uh, in the eastern uh, part of the country. And uh, with water uh, being, you know, the driver for most of these subsectors, so there's likelihood to be increased uh, water use or water sharing conflict, either between communities that share, you know, common water source or uh, sectors and subsectors such as uh, between uh, irrigation and livestock. Uh, and this is likely to, to be uh, more severe in the, in the upcoming season, particularly in Kenya and, and Somalia. Uh, finally, as a response uh, measure to these uh, impacts, uh, we are recommending that there is need to conserve water for those areas in Northern uh, GHA that have already received uh, good rainfall, but are heading into a dry season in the OND. Uh, these are mainly Djibouti, Ethiopia, and Sudan. Uh, for Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, which are also forecasted to receive below average rainfall. So there is need to update the basin management plans, basically on water allocation as well as uh, water distribution. So, and also give information uh, on that. For hydropower production, I think there is need to have more careful uh, reserve as well as lake uh, management uh, in order to stabilize uh, hydropower production. In areas that actually don't have uh, nearby water resources, mainly depending on pans or shallow groundwater and which are likely to dry up in the, in the OMD, there is need to provide water tracking services and these are mainly in Kenya and Somalia. Uh, also in the same areas, I think it's good to take advantage of whatever little rain that may come through uh, by desilting the water pans to improve the capacity as well as the quality of the water. And finally, I think to provide water treatment uh, chemicals to households that rely on open water uh, sources such as uh, open water pans or shallow groundwater uh, in Kenya and Somalia. So I think that's all from our side for the team and I thank them all. Thank you very much, over to you, Ken. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed, for the uh, presentation and saving lots of time. Uh, please share it uh, on the chat box if it's okay. too heavy, you can convert to PDF or just as it is, and every other presenter. Uh, if you look through the charts, you will find a lot of uploads, so please download as you wish so that you can engage well in the plenary session. We'll go right now to the next uh, set of presentations where we are going to uh, climate change sector. They also had their discussions. They'll have five minutes, uh, shorter time, but I'm sure you'll be able to cover what you need by that time. So climate change. Welcome and please uh, share your screen if you're able to. Dr. Mondi sharing. Thank you, Dr. Mondi. A lot of questions are still coming in. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Mondi. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, pleasure to be back again uh, to present on behalf of our uh, uh, climate change uh, group. Uh, my presentation or whatever came from the meeting which we had on 24th uh, as a team of uh, climate change experts together with the agriculture experts in the region uh, here uh, in summary form. And I want to say that it was a fruitful uh, discussion uh, with about 86 participants and uh, it was uh, really Good. Um, so what I'll present are four things. One, uh, just a, a snapshot of uh, the IPCC Six Assessment Report. And I'll also uh, give a, a small uh, discussion or report on the outcome of the meeting 
uh, between the agriculture team and uh, climate change. This slide did not Sorry? The slide did not Sorry? We are still on slide one here. Slide. Okay, I'm being reminded to move this and uh, uh, move my slides, okay. So, um, the first thing uh, I want to show is uh, a, 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 a summary of what the AR6 report is all about. Somebody did a very nice uh, capture of the whole report, a globe that is burning. Uh, and uh, the, the temperatures are rising uh, beyond uh, a, a human belief or unprecedented. So you can see uh, it has already caused a lot of uh, 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 problems, burning a lot of heat and uh, forest burning. We remember recently a lot of fire outbreak in Europe, Algeria, and all these are uh, uh, because of that increasing temperature. If you look at the graph down here, it is showing uh, rising temperatures. So uh, uh, the report is out, uh, the, 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 uh, 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 the first report, and uh, a lot of uh, information on the increasing human impact uh, in the report. C carbon dioxide concentration is highest in the two million years, and the last decade being hotter than any other period, and so on. The next thing that uh, we deliberated on as uh, climate change experts and agriculture was the, some of the impacts that this climate change has had over the region. So we are all aware that currently we just have the first uh, assessment report out or the sixth one, the others are yet to come out, but the agriculture team uh, across the board uh, realized that uh, there's a lot of enhanced agroforestry practices taking place just to help adapt well to the agriculture. And if you look at uh, the photograph that I've shown here is a typical agroforestry practices in Burundi. Uh, uh, the uh, cross board again in the region or member states of Igad, uh, there is an uh, effort to improve range line, uh, range line management. Most countries in the Igad region are also uh, getting into climate smart agriculture practices uh, just to improve the production and also uh, limit the amount of uh, greenhouse gases that will go into space because of the agricultural practices. So there's a lot of diversification, biodiversity management, and they're trying to be resilient, uh, build resilient uh, through management of some of these risks that are very common. Of course, uh, dry uh, spells are, are still an issue across board with short rains and low frequency of rain witness. This is what agriculture expert uh, uh, observed. And there are a lot of um, uh, methodology that each and every country is trying to advance uh, to, uh, 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 to be relevant in uh, this time that uh, climate change has been pronounced. Of course, uh, they noted there's a lot of shifting in agroecological zones. So it means that uh, the old agroecological zones that we used to rely on are already shifting because they change. Some of the challenges or common challenges across the board include insufficient data to monitor agriculture. And uh, all countries uh, agree that um, agriculture is still highly vulnerable to climate change. And uh, there is emerging and new pests and diseases that are really impacting on uh, uh, agriculture despite uh, 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 besides the changes in climate. And some of these pests and diseases are uh, they, they exacerbated by climate change that uh, has been witnessed. The second thing that the uh, workshop deliberated on is the issue to do with the COP. We are all aware we are going to COP26 uh, in Glasgow. And Dr. Mondi, just about a, a less than a minute. Okay, so uh, these are some of the things that uh, are going to take place in the COP. I'm sure you are all aware about them. Finalizing of Paris rule, and all other things. So this is the campus and uh, be ready. There are a lot of restrictions, but I uh, hope our delegates will take note of that. We also discussed that. Lastly, uh, we talked about the, what countries priorities are to the COP26. And uh, our basis of uh, discussion also involve uh, the NDC's review. You can see this is a summary uh, of NDC's review that is done very well by climate analytics. And uh, they have also come up even with a, an atlas that uh, you can uh, use yourself and see the impacts of climate change and uh, all that kind of thing. So this on my right are a raft of the uh, things that countries have put forward as they are going to uh, Paris in, uh, in Glasgow. So I may not read them, but uh, you can read for yourself and uh, note what countries are taking to Paris. So thank you very much, uh, as, as to.
stop there. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Philip. Very good summary and uh, very useful document. I appreciate on the chat so that uh, we can interact with it for questions. I can see questions still coming and Dr. Zaidu is engaging. Uh, Oliver is also engaging. So keep on presenters, keep on engaging the uh, participants on the different questions that they may have. We'll now go to media. I think uh, it's Luciani presenting on media. Or is it Zachary Moy? It's it's Zachary Messiani. Ah, uh, Zachary Messiani. Yes. So Zachary, please share your screen if you're able to. Is Zachary there? Do, do you need Zachary, me to share there? screen? Okay, Fiona, please share your screen, uh, the presentation on his behalf. And uh, are, you, are you there, Zachary? Unmute yourself so that we know you're there as we load the presentation. Uh, Zachary is asking if we are muting. Kimbote, are you able to see me? Uh, we seem to have had two Zacharys, so it's yeah. only one of them who was there. Now, so the other one can proceed. It's okay. Good afternoon, all members. This is Zachary Messiani from Kenya Met Department. I'm doing the presentation on the behalf of the media, public water service, and the communication focal points from each country. For the last two days, we have been working. For example, once the, the seasonal weather outlook has been released, this is the group usually do a lot of the dissemination of this weather to the various users. Everybody knows that effective communication of weather and climate information requires that the providers of this weather, that's the med department, including the ICPAC, mm -hmm. should disseminate accurate and timely messages that the, in, the vinyl users can react to this message. So we realize that from the member states, some member countries have already, or they are continuing using the already the old existing media of communicating of this information. For example, the use of the newspapers, the use of the website from each country member states. Others went further to engage the local radio stations. And also others went further for the stakeholder collaboration and also signing up the MOU and also some countries also have already developed what we call the user manual for the farming communities. Because now the world is changing, now member states are now focusing to the digital media marketing strategy, that is the use of the media. Uh, example, we have the YouTube channels, we have the telegrams, we have the Facebook nowadays, and also various WhatsApp groups, online radio and the Twitter accounts. Next slide, please. So from this slide, you can be able to see these are the contribution from each member countries whereby others will be able to have what we call the press conference during the, the release of the previous seasonal weather outlook. Other countries like South Sudan, because they were experiencing heavy rainfall, they utilized what we call the color code for giving the warning and the weather alerts. And also some countries utilized what we call the weather graphics for the dissemination of the weather to their various users. Some countries also developed what we call the newsletters in both online, both soft copy and hard copy. Other countries get an opportunity for the publication of their weather outlook in the national newspapers. And also some countries were able to invite the media briefing based on the COVID-19. Next slide. So some countries also have developed or a program known as the morning TV weather programs, which usually talks about the weather and the environment. 
this is whereby there is updates every day in the morning and the users usually ask the question what is the weather outlook and which is very good for these countries and also we realize that some member countries now have gone further and developed what we call the application programming interface for the automation of most of their services this aps has reduced workload and making much work easier. From the previous, the member states have benefited a lot from the capacity building which was conducted by the ICBAC, basically for the digital marketing and the content creation for weather and the climate information. The last slide. From what I've said above, some countries also went further after sharing this information. They wanted to know the number of people who usually get this information on the daily basis. From the, this graph, you can be able to see on June, it's represented on red. You can be able to see that at least 700 people are getting this information on the daily basis. Coming on the month of the July also, the number is increasing. And now we are in the August, heading to the, to the end of this season, the number is increasing. So from this graph, we realize that there is an increase of the new followers through the digital media like Facebook and WhatsApp. This shows that this is a positive impact on weather dissemination from various med departments, especially due during this COVID pandemic or contact of the COVID-19. On behalf of the member states, I think that is the end of my presentation and I thank you for the ICPAC for the support of, on the capacity building. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Zachary, and, uh, for your message and appreciation. Uh, I think we have gone through all the presentations in the sector that uh, were discussed on the impact. A lot of questions are coming in the chat. So right now we'll go into the plenary uh, session of it. And I also welcome Fiona to help me through the questions. But one question that has been coming over and over and it's been answered, uh, Dr. Zeudi, a lot of uh, people are asking about downscaling of the focus. Maybe you can uh, talk about the downscaling in about two minutes or so on the next stages after the regional gap of what happens, uh, because that's a question that is coming over and over from many users. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much, um, Ken. Um, so for uh, downscaling, the first thing, um, we have um, 10 NMHS forecast uh, with us uh, last week. So they have the capacity to uh, develop forecasts for national as well as for their sub-national levels. So they can produce everything that we show. Also, they can produce using the facilities that we have now. In addition to that, the ICPAC plans to do a sub-regional um, IGAR cluster workshop on climate, uh, a climate forum and user engagement, which we had uh, experience before for the Karamoja. Now in September, we are planning to do that for um, the uh, cross-border areas from South Sudan, Uganda, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia um, border uh, areas. So uh, we will be doing that at sub-regional level, but at national and sub-national level, the main services are equipped to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, just to go into the chat, there's one chat that has no one, I've not seen anyone address a uh, question. Priscilla asked about uh, in the region, most member states have the country programming papers that were initiated and I Idris Iga drought resilience, disaster resilience and sustainability initiative. Could they be reviewed? I'm guessing that goes to Julie who was uh, uh, checking through the DRM. Will you know about that? and? Uh, able to answer on that, Julie? Mm. Are you around, Julie? Yes, yes, thank you, Ken. And uh, that I'll wish Dr. Ahmed will be able to have more information on, on the DRC aspect. 
So kindly, Kim, you'd allow Dr. Med to, to speak on this matter. Dr. Ahmed, are you able to be unmuted so that you can talk about it, GC? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ken. Uh, with regards to the Idrisi, currently there is uh, an ongoing discussion on the second phase, uh, and I'm sure all those points are uh, going to be considered. Uh, but overall, uh, as IGAD, the approach is um, more focused towards uh, the risk reduction side of it and building uh, ultimately the resilience of communities, which will uh, address uh, the issue of uh, risks, um, uh, you know, in a more sustainable ways. So that is where we are now, uh, over to you, Ken. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. I hope it's clear for Priscilla. Uh, another question coming from Dominic. Uh, uh, that was about on scaling, it's already been answered. Alor asked about conflict over water and pasture expected in South Sudan, and there was a very good uh, response from Mohammed Hassan, which I think, Dr. Mohammed, if you, if you are willing to just highlight, because a lot of countries are going through, or potentially might go through the same time conflict due to water scarcity this season. Uh, you gave a very good response. Maybe you can just emphasize on the message here, Dr. Hassan. Yeah, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, I mean, there are some issues that are related to water, which are cross bound uh, boundary. So uh, in the case of South Sudan, as uh, my colleague has mentioned, so they seem to have better water availability, but that will attract obviously uh, pastoralists from across the border and they will meet communities there. So it's always good to prepare for that. I think that's more on the conflict management side but it's also good to share the water as well as to have some agreements and some rules and you know to be followed in, in terms of that. Some of the cases, I think the conflict know better, these rules are not followed or these arrangements are not followed, which leads to some uh, you know, skirmishes or some conflict. But nevertheless, I think if an area has good water, obviously uh, for the next two, three months, it may be able to take care. The most difficult part of it is to make some arrangements on that is working for both uh, the visitors as well as the residents, if I may call it that way. So as I said to my colleague from South Sudan, it's always good to anticipate that and to prepare the, the host community uh, for such a scenario. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, there's a question to Dr. Philip by Stefan, which uh, he's answered, but uh, I, I also thought many more people could benefit from the clarification. How can ICPAC explore the impact of anthropogenic climate change on seasonal extremes? If there's an opportunity to bridge the gap between the cuddle model analysis and how we can go about reconciling disparities between the observed trends and projections from modeling community. Uh, Dr. Philip, it's a very interesting response you gave. If you could just uh, expound on it here for, more, for everyone to benefit from the answer. Are you are you around, Dr. Philip? Able to unmute yourself? Okay, now I've unmuted. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Stefan, for the questions. And uh, I want to combine uh, the two with what was asked in the morning or the, in the previous session. Uh, there is a lot of concern from uh, scientific community that uh, very few. Uh, research work is coming from our region and Africa uh, in general. And uh, the question in the morning was about the insight on the trends of uh, uh, climate variability in the last decade uh, from member state. IPC mentioned the uh, uh, lack of uh, data and they did not even have confidence with the four papers that uh, were from the uh, Northern Eastern Africa and Southeastern Africa region that went into the analysis. So uh, for us to get uh, uh, well-balanced uh, uh, information from uh, climate change, we need to have a lot of research work done. And particularly, we need to use the few data points that we have in the region to be able to carry out uh, research. Remember, currently, we have a lot of uh, uh, satellite information that is uh, proxy. And we cannot say with certainty, this, uh, with certainty that these are real observed data. Member states have got real observed data that can really be used to 
uh, carry out uh, informative research. So I remember one time uh, in 2010, we had uh, member states coming to ICPAC with their daily rainfall data and daily temperature maximum and minimum. And that is the time that we did a lot of analysis and we were able to inform uh, confidently the climate variability and change within the region because we use real observed data. So my advice or my encouragement is to member state that uh, let's use the data points that we have uh, for the uh, analysis and then our region will be well informed in terms of the issue of climate change. So I've just uh, responded to Stefan. So he wanted to know um, uh, whether uh, we combine, uh, whether we have uh, uh, clear information about the decadal change over the region and, uh, and, and, and rainfall. So uh, if you remember again, Stefan, we have uh, some studies that were done on the cuddle, but ended up in 2010. It means that we need to have more data points so from the member states so that we continue with this analysis. Whenever we are able to see the background change in rainfall and temperature, we can be able to uh, roughly predict any additional uh, change on it in terms of uh, short time scale. So, the long-term change on the cuddle scale is uh, usually influenced by external factors like the sun, solar radiation, and so on. Whatever comes as a variability or on top of that is uh, because of human uh, impact. So when we have this data and we have this analysis done, I believe the region will be well informed. And I think that is what I can say, but uh, I'm not limiting it to other experts in the room. You can add. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. Philip. That's a very comprehensive answer that uh, touched on, uh, I think, even beyond what uh, Stefan asked on also data and the impact. Uh, there's one interesting discussion point on uh, agriculture. If uh, Oliver, you're there. Uh, Dr. Sabiti asked about uh, the advisory on increasing the acreage planted or reducing it. Uh, his argument is that if you increase it, you have more chances of getting more harvest. Uh, but your advisory was introducing. Maybe you can uh, talk about that, Oliver. Oliver, are you around? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I was not able to unmute. Um, uh, and thank you for that question from uh, actually Dr. Sabiti. Uh, and actually from the general implication that we gave for the sector is that uh, there are actually poor prospects for the uh, uh, agricultural uh, production for this coming season. But um, having said that, uh, the most important thing that uh, to take note of as we even advise our farmers is actually to keep uh, proper attention on selection of seed varieties. As, as you've seen that uh, this coming season is actually going to be um, we are likely to have uh, depressed rainfall conditions, which is actually not very conducive, but we need to really give uh, proper attention on selection of, even if, uh, as we talk of even increasing or decreasing the acreage, we need to, the most important thing is to give um, uh, proper attention to selection of seed varieties and also diversification to other livelihood sources, which was actually part of the, part of the advisories that uh, we gave. And uh, this is actually uh, to ensure that uh, farmers, are the resilience of uh, smallholder farmers and also other farmers are also enhanced. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Oliver. Uh, I, going through, I think we've discussed most of the questions or the ones that might be missing. Uh, there are still presentations that might be missing, not uploaded, please upload them, presenters, uh, so that people can download them early enough uh, before they upload it still in the site. The same presentation will all be available on the ICPAC site on the GACOF, and you can also get a zip of all uh, presentations. There's one interesting also question from uh, Adunia Gemeda. If, if he was asking me, we can have insight on the trends on climate variability in the last decade. And uh, one of the IPCC reports, as had been mentioned earlier, lacks evidence in this region, unlike Southern Africa. Uh, and uh, a reference was given there by Andrew Coleman. But in the same way, 
Will uh, Dr. Philip have a reaction on that? On the IPCC report lacking evidence for this region? Any research planned for this area? Thank you, Chair, once again. I think that is what I combined with Stefan's question. Uh, I said uh, clearly that uh, we need to be proactive, we need to be open, we need to be frank to ourselves as a region. Let's use whatever data points that we have and uh, do more research. Uh, you note that uh, some of these things like extreme events, it's very difficult to study extreme events with the daily uh, satellite information or a proxy data. These are really uh, uh, the, the, the daily satellite proxy data as a lot of noise. You cannot really use them to get any information that needed. So we just need to attribute some of the changes we're seeing to the climate change we talk about. We need real observed data. That's what I said, and I still believe uh, in future, going forward, we will have member states coming together with their daily rainfall, temperature, maximum, minimum, so that we compute some of the even indices that uh, are very important to the uh, uh, climate change detective uh, team and uh, we move forward, publish, and then the IPCC would be able to get some of this information about our region. Over to you, Chair. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Philip, yet again. Uh, there's one reaction or during the presentation, I noticed uh, a link of fires in the environment and policy sector that there are fires increasing in the region. Uh, is the all around so that you also talk about that, highlight the, uh, the prospect of fires becoming more in the oncoming dry season and their impact in, in the protected areas? Uh, thank you, you very much, uh, Chair. Yes, I'm here, Kenneth. Um, so I think it was reported by Tanzania and Kenya as well, especially for Kenya, especially in Savo West and Chulu, that there has been a lot of fires. And then from the graphs that were shared um, with Eugene in the morning in terms of the JJS uh, uh, impacts, you could see that from the graphs that were created based on earth observation data, you could see that the number of fires exceeds by a very large margin, the long-term average number of fires in this fire season as well. And then given the fact that OND is expected to be drier uh, than usual, then we expect an increase of fires, not just uh, Kenya, Tanzania, but probably in South Sudan as well. Um, so I think one of the recommendations that came out is for uh, park managers, for example, or uh, officers in charge of forests to come up or to, to prepare fire management uh, policies or practices or strategies to tackle the fire, but also to revamp or enhance capacity of um, the officers on the ground um, of, the, uh, of the officers on the ground to tackle uh, the fire that are expected to be on the increase. Uh, yeah, thank you, Kenneth. I think that is all regarding that aspect. Thank you, Viola, for that. Uh, so fire, the fire season about to start also in many countries, uh, Sudan, South Sudan, part of Kenya, Southern Ethiopia. So very good advice for you that we expect in this season. I think with that, uh, I'd like to wrap up this session for now, this session so that we, we can now keep on time. It's been very exciting and very good engaging with everyone here. Good questions coming and the presenters. I was, uh, my name is Kenneth Mwangi, chairing this session and being rapporteured by Ju Julie from IFAC. And we thank you for the time. I'll just hand it now to, the, to, to Fiona so that she can guide us on how we do the next session. Thank you very much, Fiona. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Ken. Um, great job and great job to all of the um, presenters, the sector heads, climate change, um, media, really, really interesting and rich information and very important for all of us to take back to our countries and build this into the, the work that we are doing and communicate with our colleagues and, and National Met and so on. Um, thanks all for putting your presentations in the chat as well, so they're available. Um, we're now moving on to the partnership session. So we have some rapid fire short presentations from five different projects. So a little bit on um, what's happening um, in ICPAC, 
and related pro projects that relate to ICPAC that are either ongoing or closing or just starting up. So kind of information session, and I will hand over to Linda to, to take us through. Over to you, Linda. Uh, thank you very much, Fiona. Uh, as you mentioned, this is um, the session where we look at some of the projects that have come up or have been ongoing since the last um, time we met. And we, like Fiona has mentioned, we have a number of uh, presentations. All the presentations have uh, been lined up. So for the presenters, we'll have a violin team on the East African Drought Watch, who will be followed by Hussein talking about Klimsa, and then Abebe will come in with Down to Earth. Doreen will tell us about the new Desert Locus platform. And finally, we'll finish with um, John Mungai from WISA. So um, if we can have a presentation up, then I can welcome um, Viola to begin to start us off in this session. Well, the presentation will be given by Alfred. Uh, Alfred, I see your uh, mic is unmuted. You can go ahead and um, begin your yeah, presentation. Maybe, yeah. yeah, maybe Viola has a problem. Hello, I'm Alfred Jager. I work for the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. And we made a project together with uh, IGPAC on setting up a drought watch system uh, in uh, for the East African region. So basically what you saw in many of the presentations comes back in this system. You go to the next slide. Uh, sorry, okay. Alfred. Yeah. I will share. You are there. Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yeah, here you are again. Okay, you start, Viola. Yes, let me. Um, sorry, um, Fiona, I seem to have a technical issue. Would you kindly share the slide for us, the presentation, Fiona? Uh, yes, I can do if whoever's sharing now could stop sharing um, and then just give me a moment. This is now, sorry, remind me again, it's the East Africa Drought Watch. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Coming up. It's, it's okay, Fiona, I can share my screen. I have it lined up. Okay, is that you sharing now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, there you go. Okay, Viola. Okay, um, and yeah. do you want to continue or shall I? No, you go? can continue, you can continue. Okay, yeah. <laughs> all right, so <laughs> firstly, apologies for the technical hitch. Um, as Alfred has mentioned that this is one of the projects that uh, ICPAC has been doing with our Joint Research Center. And uh, we have been developing the East Africa Drought Watch, which we, have, which we have been working on over the past year. And as you have seen, uh, East Africa region is highly vulnerable to extreme weather and climate events. This include drought and floods as well. Also important to note is that the population is highly dependent on uh, rain-fed agriculture. And this means that the food security situation in the region is very sensitive to drought conditions. And this uh, therefore brings us to the point where it's therefore important to monitor drought conditions um, as they occur. So the solution that we have come up with together is a regional drought monitoring system that at the moment covers 11 countries. So these are the 11 ICPAC countries. And the idea is to continuously and automatically monitor drought conditions in the region. And uh, the underlying principle is to provide actionable information. And we have come to define actionable information simply as information that someone can do something about. And for us, it's important to provide actionable information to influence policy, uh, to support early action, but also to inform change and adaptation of land use as well. 
So in a nutshell, the East Africa Drought Watch uh, provides automatic 10-day warnings for developing in actual drought conditions, but also we have added an additional indicator that shows recovery from drought conditions as well. And uh, from the East Africa Drought Watch as well, you're able to get time series analysis of a particular region. So if you're interested in a geographic region, you can be able to um, get analysis of this particular region. On the right, what you see is an animation of um, the drought conditions as produced by the system from June all the way to the first uh, decade of August. And uh, what you can see is that currently uh, we had two geographic drought events in the month of uh, July. Um, I will hand over to Alfred for the next slide. Uh, Linda, kindly move to the next slide. Thank you. Yes, well, uh, the trick that we did is we, we provided them what, they, what I call a modern map viewer. So basically that allows you to integrate all your data, both in time and in space. And that is of course very important to help you to understand how a drought evolves and how droughts in the past were also affecting the region. And that, then you can learn from the droughts in the past, what happened and how you addressed it. Like we saw this morning, also we base most of the information on the SPI, which is a kind of rainfall anomaly, but you can compute it for a various time periods, for one month up to four years. And that gives you an indication of what you would call a flash drought, or for example, a hydrological drought, that your rivers go down or the wells are very low. Then the second product that we have is soil moisture anomaly, which are computed in a kind of hybrid way through a model called GLOFAST and by the satellite that gives you the first three centimeter of the soil moisture. This parameter is very important to understand the impact of drought on crops, basically. Then, and we had this discussion also, we have another product that is computing the vegetation response. Basically, if a plant is not growing well, then he will reflect in a different way the light. And you can detect it with, with the satellite. And if these three parameters confirm each other, then we really say, okay, we have a problem in the area and you can do this thing automatically. Alfred, you have about one minute. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So how we do this, we, we combine these three data sets uh, with the, uh, with uh, the rainfall, the SPI, the soil moisture and the vegetation response. Um, one of the issues that we now have uh, for the region is this combined index is tuned for, um, let's say a not tropical climate for European climate. So the issue is now to tune it to the East African climate where you have particular issues that you don't find in Europe like failing rainy seasons, long-term land degradation, and what we also saw this morning, uh, pastoral practices that also require specific things. So we need your feedback on how to tune this system for this kind of need. If you then go to the next slide, Fiona, you see, okay, basically you see uh, the people developing the system. Um, Eric at the bottom is also developing the East African Hazard Watch, also integrating all kinds of data in space and in time. And Grace develops this particular system with, uh, let's say, we, we uh, Viola and myself, we try to address the user needs. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alfred and Viola. Um, next, we'll have Hussein talking about the Klimsa project. Um, Hussein Said, if uh, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Um, if you have any questions for Alfred and Viola, just put them on the chat. I know this, will, this should attract a lot of attention because we've just talked about a focus that is predicting depressed um, rainfall. So this tool should come uh, that should be very useful in the in the upcoming season. So, um, Hussein, if we can have uh, Kimoto, if you can help Hussein, Said, 
give him access so he can unmute himself and give the next presentation. Um, Kimoth, are you here? Uh, we seem to be having some technical issues. Okay, Hussein, go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you, Linda. Sorry, I was not uh, able to unmute myself. Yeah, good uh, afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm going to present about uh, the ICPA component of the Climate Service and Related Applications CLIMSA program. Uh, just to uh, give you a brief background about the CLIMSA program, uh, the overall objective of the program is to strengthen climate service value chain at regional, national, and subnational level. It is funded by the 11th European Development Fund. The funding amount is 8 million euro. Uh, the action signed in December 2019 and the implementation started in January 2020. Uh, the project time frame uh, is four years uh, from January 2020 up to December 2023. Uh, and the, the region or the zone that is benefiting from this action is the Horn of Africa, uh, which are uh, the EGAD member countries but there are two regional focus countries, which are Kenya and Uganda. Uh, the technical partners include uh, WMO, UMEDSAT, JRC, uh, uh, NMHS in IGAD member countries, as well as the African Caribbean Pacific uh, group of states. Um, the action has five result areas, which are aligned with the uh, five GFCS pillars, uh, which has a, a user interface platform component, a climate service information system, observation modeling, and the capacity development uh, cross-cutting, uh, as well as the uh, mainstreaming um, climate information into uh, decision-making. Next slide. Uh, to To highlight just some of the achievements in each result area, under result area one, uh, which is improved interaction between users, researchers, and climate service providers, uh, we supported uh, the establishment of a national framework for climate service for Kenya. We have also contributed to the JHA Climate Outlook Forums, uh, co-production activities, as well as the user feedback assessment. We also provide uh, new and improved climate products to the FS and WG group. Uh, which is a, uh, a, a regional uh, user interface platform for agriculture and food security sector, which is on monthly and on need basis. Also supported the uh, uh, Kenya Meteorology Department in organizing the first and second national climate outlook forums. Uh, next, on result area two, which is effective provision of climate service at regional and national levels, uh, we started developing uh, a new uh, climate products. The one you saw like the flexible forecast, the probability of exceedance, as well as this, the standardized precipitation index. Um, also supported the NMHSs to produce climate products and information at the national and the subnational level using the ICPAC HPC um, facility. So they're able to produce uh, uh, forecasts at national and subnational level uh, using this uh, HPC facility. Uh, and also in support of this uh, uh, program, uh, we have installed the climate station as well as the agricultural watch platform, the, the, the one you see on this one down, which is also very important for monitoring the uh, for, crop, uh, for crop land and as well as the rangeland monitoring which is accessible in the ICPAC clusters uh, and also integrated to, to the East Africa Hazard Watch. On uh, result area three, improved access to climate information. Uh, the team upgraded the data library and the map room for KMD as well as for uh, UNIMA, and also trained the members, uh, the staff members on the update and the maintenance of the data library. Uh, a regional guidance for operational production of objective seasonal forecasts for GHA region also developed with support uh, uh, by WMO. Uh, next slide. On uh, capacity development. 
Okay, on capacity development, uh, we have developed the capacity uh, uh, building plan on strategic and thematic uh, issues at ICPAC. Also supported uh, uh, masters and postgraduate diploma students, five masters and seven postgraduate diploma. We have also conducted uh, training workshops in the different on the different thematic areas, uh, which are just a screenshot the photos of some of the trainings that we conducted physically and virtually for the last one and a half years. Next. On the result area five, uh, on uh, which is enhanced climate improvement decision making process at regional and national level, as uh, the uh, project staff contributed to the East Africa Hazard Watch, which you have been uh, hearing about it, as well as uh, the preparation of summary for decision makers uh, after each GACOS. Uh, this is all I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Hussein. Uh, we can go straight to Abebe. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Linda. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Abebe Tadege uh, from ICPAC. Uh, my presentation is uh, uh, on a project known as Down to Earth. Uh, as uh, most of you might uh, uh, might be informed, uh, ICPAC is not only operational center, it also conducts research. So Down to Earth project is, uh, is, is a, a research project primarily. So the Down to Earth is a translation of climate information into uh, multi-level decision support for social adaptation, policy development, and resilience to water scarcity in the Horn of, in the Horn of uh, Africa drylands. And the focus of the project is on water scarcity and food insecurity challenges in rural communities within the Horn of Africa drylands, uh, we call it HAD for short, with a geographical, a geographical focus on drylands of Kenya, Somalia, and uh, Ethiopia. The duration of the project is uh, uh, four years. Uh, and funding is about 6.65 million euro contributed through uh, the EU Horizon 2020 program uh, on the, in the component of climate services for Africa. And then we have six work packages, 15 activities distributed among a consortium of 14 institutions from eight countries and coordinated by uh, uh, Cardiff University. The partners are universities, NGOs, and climate services. Uh, the project outcomes enhanced climate service capability, especially for ECPAC, enhanced adaptation policies and communication, improved water forecast, uh, a robust climate change scenario using the IPCC CMIPSIC model outputs. Next. Yeah, uh, the components of uh, the, the, the project are one model uh, and tools development. For example, uh, the, the project will produce uh, a regional hydrological model known as uh, COALIT. COALIT stands for climate into useful water and land information uh, in dry lands. Uh, we have also agent-based modeling. Uh, this agent-based modeling ABM for short, uh, models the, uh, the interaction of the communities and individuals to climate shocks like drought and floods. Uh, we have also uh, exploration of future climate projections and their impact on water and livelihoods. Uh, we'll have mobile app development, both desktop and smartphone versions. Uh, we engage community in the research uh, and also uh, improvement of climate change uh, uh, services in the region. Uh, we have also climate service capacity building. That's a key component. We'll have a, se a series of trainings for, for the member countries, especially the three countries, and we'll have a dissemination and communication uh, component as well. Uh, just to this graphics shows you how uh, a, a forecast, for example, the objective forecast provided by the climate modeling team can be used as an input for the quality model. And then the quality model can provide uh, uh, outputs like soil moisture and groundwater. This is quantitative 
uh, information on soil moisture and uh, groundwater. And that can be analyzed and provided to uh, decision making. And the, all of this exercise will help us uh, improving uh, the climate services provided by ICPA. And term, we are already one year in the project. Uh, like I said, it is a, a four year project. We are in one year. What has been achieved so far? Kickoff meeting of the projects was held. Website is already uh, up and running. Uh, communication and dis dissemination plan is uh, already developed. Uh, project sites for community engagement and social economic survey identified, especially in Isiolo County in Kenya, Sabah Boru district in Ethiopia, and uh, Oduani yeah, district in Somaliland. Uh, are. Teams are also formed, national focal points, project staff for the, the D2E also are uh, on board. Uh, and also we have uh, newsletters, uh, regular challenges, accessing climate and water data, uh, COVID issue also uh, are, are barriers. Um, more information can be uh, found from the link I just showed on the screen. And these are the partners uh, engaged in, in the project. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions, uh, you are most welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Bebe. Uh, because of time, we'll be answering all the questions in the chat. So if you have any questions for any presenters, please uh, post them in the chat. And if you've given any presentation, please go to the chat and answer some of the questions. Um, uh, again, uh, the final presentation will come from uh, Mr. John Mongai from talking about WISA. And then I'll encourage all the presenters, please drop your presentations um, on the chat as well. Uh, John, you're welcome. Madam Chair, I think uh, you forgot the interregional platform on Desert Locust, or does it come after John? Yes, I think we'll have to do it after John. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. And uh, welcome to this uh, very short uh, presentation on WISA. We have been on the ground since 2016, and all our projects are closing this year. Some of them have already closed, actually. And the thing is that we've been trying to bring about transformational change in the quality and uh, accessibility and use of uh, climate information in the region. Uh, next, please. Now, we have quite a few achievements and uh, wiser. But since this is uh, the theme for this uh, GACOF is resilience and climate, we chose just a few indicators here on resilience to show you uh, what we have achieved in this regard. And uh, the current analysis suggests that uh, about 3 million households are getting improved access to weather and climate information through all our 12 projects. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's just on my side, but uh, John, we seem to be having a problem with your connection. Yeah, same here. Uh, sorry, John, we have a problem with you. Actually, using because it's one thing to access. Hello, John. John, you keep breaking up. It's another one to use. So about half a million of those. Then the survey we undertook this year improved resilience due, uh, and we've also accrued uh, some about two hundred million pounds. Uh, and one may ask, how? Hello, can you hear Sorry, me? Sorry, you, yes, it's been okay. Breaking continue. Up. You can continue. Just keep going. Oh yes, we have developed a method uh, of doing resilience uh, indicators and so forth because many projects st stop at uh, output level or outcome level or even impact, but we're going to step further to, to give indications of resilience and uh, how to guide on how to you can do resilience uh, is being developed and be shared probably in the next day, uh, Yakov. Next, please. Next. So, uh, the Poiza project about April time, we 
all the projects, the funders, and other people interested in weather and climate information together. And uh, a lot of recommendations came out of out of this uh, particular event. Can you go back, please, a little bit? Go back a little. I just want to speak very briefly to this uh, uh, policy briefs which came out of that uh, learning event. We have about four of them. And the first one is talking about designing the next generation of co-produced climate services. And we're saying that if you if you're a project or a program and you want to have a scalable project, sustainable project, you have to look at the whole value chain of climate services. You don't just fund, for example, the producers only because they're going to have a very good product, but then that product will not be able to get to the people. So you look at the producers, intermediaries, and also the users, uh, how they can understand the forecast. So that's the first uh, uh, brief, uh, the very good words, if you can get hold of it, uh, which can guide you on how to do that. That's for uh, funders. We have another one on co-production. Co-production is a byword which I think uh, mostly was not existing much before as I came into the region. And all our projects have uh, co-production elements in them. And so when you bring the user, intermediaries, and the producers, you're able to give a product which the user will trust more, there'll be more uptake, there'll be more use. And so this particular brief policy brief talks to that whole thing of uh, co-production on how you can go from just consultative to what we are calling immersive co-production, uh, where we have feedback loops and, and everything else. Uh, the next one is to have been doing a gender blind projects, but now this one is advocating for a situation whereby you are taking, you're being sensitive uh, to the gender roles. Um, so there's a whole brief on how to to wear, uh, so to speak, a gender lens in your projects and programs. And the last one speaks to national met, meteorological and hydrological services. There are many issues with the MET and uh, one of it is capacity development. And all our projects, we were able to talk to, to work through the national med services. And what we are, we are saying here basically is that uh, capacity development within NMHSs should go beyond building just technical skills. You have to invest in holistic skills, which will enable national med services to make stronger business cases, for example, of their work and advocate for more funding and support from governments and other funding uh, partners and so forth. So let me speak to the last, uh, to the last slide, if you will. And this, because this is an ICPAC, yeah, this is an ICPAC event. Many of you know that we have been supporting ICPAC, on, on, and ICPAC itself has been supporting the countries which make it on the, you know human capacity development to be able to develop the kind of products that we saw today, and also uh, you know technical capacities like uh, HPC, so that the people when they're in their countries can be able to access this computer and run their own models. But I'm happy to announce here that we have granted ICPAC a small extension to December 2021. And these are the three things they're supposed to come up with. For example, you know that in Somalia, we don't have a national health service per se. We have different ministries dealing with the meteorological issues. So there's a working group which you want to strengthen. At the end of the day, at some point in future, we want a national health service for Somalia. And then a community of practice um, of climate and, and weather in East Africa. We have many people, either researchers or just users or producers. We want to bring all these people in a community of practice so that we can be able to share best practice in climate and weather information. And finally, finally, uh, ICPAC is supposed to produce a guideline on provision of weather and climate information services in fragile environments. As you know, some of our countries are, you know, have fragile institutions, you know, fragile, uh, you know, economically and, and so on and so forth. But people still need information for them to adapt. So how can you do that? So ICPAC is going to be showing us the way and they're going to come up with that guideline. So for, for any of this information, if you want any further information, you can drop me an email at john.mongai at metaoffice.gov.uk and then I'll be able to share more with you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, John. Our final presentation will be from um, uh, Doreen on the Desert Locust. Uh, Doreen. Yes, please. Do you want to um, share or do you want me to share? You can help me share. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so IGAD is implementing a new three-year project that is going to help set up an interregional platform on the sustainable management of desert locust and other transboundary pests in the in the region and the project is being funded by the world bank it will run from july it is running from july 2021 to august 2024 and it's part of the world's bank the world bank's emergency locust response pro program phase that is also supporting south sudan to respond to the desert locust invasion the goal of the platform uh, that is going to be formed will be to strengthen synergies, sustain, sustained management and control of desert locusts and other transboundary pests in the region. But uh, the platform will not be only extended to the IGAD countries, but also to other countries like Yemen and Saudi Arabia that are current, that are really, really frontline countries for desert locusts in, and into our region. But um, the management of the platform will involve member states, those countries that are also affected, as well as other partners. Next, Linda. So what, what in, the, in, the, in the three years, next. Yeah, in the three years, we hope to achieve a number of things, but the four main ones will be to, to develop guidelines that will, uh, that will inform the national preparedness plans. And in the national preparedness plans, they will set out the roadmap and actions that each and every member state will undertake and the requirements needed in case of a desert locust or uh, an invasion by other transboundary pests such as the fall armyworm. The plans will also be part of the early warning, early response system in the, in the region that will help uh, direct us in the monitoring and surveillance within the region. But also we'll support the member states to finalize the national preparedness plans. We will come up with a regional preparedness plan and also we'll come up with a knowledge management and communication products that will raise awareness, but also uh, uh, create uh, help countries and other people to manage the locusts. Uh, we are going to involve as many partners as possible in this project. And one, one of the things that we are going to do is to di disclose a number of documents. One of them will be the environmental and social commitment plan, the labor management procedures, the stakeholder engagement plan, as well as the project manual. This will be made available through the ICPACA, IGAD and World Bank websites, as well as through email and other, so and other social media programs. So we welcome you to uh, partner with us as we implement this pro project. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Doreen, for being straight to the point and bringing us to our last presentation of today. Again, if you have any questions for any of the uh, presenters, please uh, feel free to use a chat box. I uh, want to welcome um, Fiona to tell us about this afternoon's side event as we come to a close and get ready to the main um, event, which is on the release of the focus. So Fiona, if you could just take us to what's happening this afternoon uh, before I invite uh, Mr. Peru to take us to the conclusion of this session. Great, thanks so much. Thanks, Linda. And thanks to all the presenters, really interesting projects. Um, we don't have time for any um, to and fro in, the, in this meeting. Um, luckily, the first side event at um, actually the, <clears throat> I think the second side event, first and second side events in the list uh, will also touch on the, the East Africa Droughts Hazard Watch. Um, but this afternoon, so any questions, please keep using the chat box um, and look them up on, um, on the web and so on. Um, we're about to close, but to announce that at 2.30 up to 4 o'clock, we will have four side events. They are all happening at the same time. Um, the first two are the East Africa Climate Hazard Watch and the Agricultural Monitoring for Eastern Africa. Um, in, if you are interested in these two side events, you must stay on this same Zoom link that we're on now. And uh, you'll have at 2.30, you'll have the opportunity to select um, the breakout room um, for the, for the um, event that you want to join. So these two, East Africa Climate Hazards Watch, Agricultural Monitoring in Eastern Africa, they are ICPAC products and they'll take you through practical sessions. Um, you need to stay on this link and pick the breakout room for the one you want to join. 
We have a third side event also starting at 2.30, which is the review, going through the reviewed version of IGAD's regional climate change strategy. Philip will be leading that. Um, I will post this Zoom link into the chat box as well as soon as I stop sharing. Um, some people have already registered for this, um, but you're also welcome to join if you're interested in the EGAD regional climate change strategy and the review of it. Um, you need to come off this Zoom meeting and then open uh, the new Zoom link, uh, which is here and I'll share in the chat. And our final fourth one is the Climate Data Managers Working Group. It's a working group. So it's by invitation only for those of you who are in the working group. Carolina May is your contact person and you should have already received the Zoom link um, in your invitation to this working group meeting. So these are very much um, like the kind of working groups and side events that we would normally have at a face-to-face -face GACO. And um, you're most welcome to join the first three, but if you've been invited and you're part of Climate Data Managers Working Group, please join Paulino for that one. I'll stop sharing now and I'll paste the, um, the climate change links here in the chat box for the Zoom link for the climate change meeting. Um, otherwise, we are closing here. Thank you so much um, to everybody for your great participation this morning. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to everyone who asked questions. Um, I hope you did get answers. Um, you can still keep asking your questions in the chat. If you haven't had answers, you could chase. Thank you uh, to the speakers for, um, for your answers. Um, it's been a very rich morning and I would like now to hand over to um, Mr. Averu to take us into the closing session. Over to you, Mr. Averu. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Fiona, for a uh, very nice uh, facilitation. I think uh, I will need to thank all of you, uh, all the moderators, uh, for work well done. Uh, I think it has been a very nice day. Uh, we are on time. I think. Uh, uh, and you are going to, I think, go to the main event now, but of course we are reminded uh, for afternoon, so kindly uh, prepare to join the uh, respective uh, side events. Mine is very simple, uh, is to welcome uh, the director of ICPAC, Dr. Angule Datan, uh, to release the NGAC of 59 statement. Dr. Mgule Datan, if you are here, you can begin uh, the statement. Do you have Mgule Datan inside? Hello? I think he's here, but he seems to be, let's see if he may be mute. So uh, I, I couldn't talk. Uh, I was I was, I was muted. So you're telling me talk and and, and, and. <laughs> I don't have an access to the microphone. Kimoto. You are uh, loud and clear, Dr. Atan. Now, now, now I'm loud and clear. I can see. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. And thank you all of you. Actually, uh let's give an applause to the all the presenters and, 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 and the chairs of the various uh, uh, sessions. Thank you very much. And, and to the organizing committee uh, for job well done. Uh, now let me read uh, the uh, 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 press release for uh, Garkov uh, 59. Uh, drier than usual conditions are forecasted in Tanzania, Burundi, Rwanda, Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia and Eritrea. August 26, 2021, Nairobi. The upcoming rainfall season, October to December, is an important season for Uganda, Kenya, 
northern Tanzania, southern and central Somalia, and uh, southern Ethiopia and South Sudan. Much of Rwanda and much of Rwanda and Burundi. For some of those countries, this is the main farming season and it represents up to 70% of the total annual rainfall. A drier than usual season is forecasted across Eastern Africa from October to December 2021, in particular in Tanzania, Burundi, Rwanda, Kenya, Southern and Central Somalia, uh, and Northwestern Somalia also, Southern and Southwestern Ethiopia, and the Red Sea coast of Northern Eritrea. Of particular concern are the drier than usual conditions forecasted over across uh, the border area of Kenya and Somalia, where this season actually is quite, quite important. 2021 is, is being an unexpected to continue to be a drier than usual year for the majority of the region. Observations of rainfall over the past month, months reveal that the region has been facing rainfall deficits in many parts of Central and Southern Eastern Africa. This is forecasted to remain until December 2021. Past observed deficits coupled with our forecast indicate moderate to severe drought conditions in the region, in particular over Uganda, southeastern Ethiopia, eastern Kenya, southern Somalia and Tanzania. The start of the season is expected to be delayed by up to two weeks, especially over eastern Kenya and southern Somalia. The forecast indicates that South Sudan, northwestern Uganda, and southwestern Ethiopia will receive over 200 millimeters and 300 millimeters during the entire season. This is a low chance of exceeding uh, 200 and 300 over, 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 most, over most of other regions, in particular over Eastern Kenya and Southern uh, Tanzania. Besides the drier conditions, warmer than usual temperatures are expected across the region, in particular in Eastern Kenya, Somalia, Eastern parts of Ethiopia and, and Eastern Sudan. The food security and nutrition situation is likely to worsen, especially in the arid and semi-arid regions, requiring the need for expanding humanitarian assistance and interventions across the region. Generally, generally poor rains, late onset, coupled with other non-climatic conditions, uh, with other non-climatic drivers like COVID-19, economic shocks, and conflict present poor prospects for farming across the region. Considering the ongoing simultaneous humanitarian emergencies impacting the region, including the pandemic, the regional and national authorities are encouraged to use this seasonal forecast to develop contingency plans and to update them with weekly and monthly forecasts provided by ICPAC and the National Meteorological Services. Uh, note, uh, Garkov uh, 59 uh, was convened online uh so I'll, I'll 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 stop there uh the the full statement will be posted on online it has maps uh of 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 of, of the outlook be rainfall or temperature uh
with those words, I, I now I can go to my concluding remarks for, for the meeting. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I would like to thank you all for the closing of a successful forum. Uh, on the last two weeks, especially today, plenty of knowledge has been shared and some suggestions were made, which are key to improving the organization of future forums. Uh, the next one is in, in February of next year uh, to strengthen the user interface platform. I, I hope that the next uh, Garkov uh, will be a, a live one if this pandemic sub subsides. I would, like, I would like to thank you all for participating in this forum and making, a very, and making it a very su successful one uh, thank you uh, to the member states, our partners, uh, and the ICPAC staff that has been working on this for quite uh, for the last two months. Uh, a special thanks to our National Meteorological Service of the member states. We value your collaboration, and without your collaboration, this won't have been possible. I would like also to thank all the presenters and repertoires and chairs of the various sessions, as well as all the uh, active participants. This seasonal forecast is particularly important uh, because the season, as <clears throat> I said in the statement I was reading <clears throat> a few minutes ago, uh, the forecast is to be drier than usual for most of the region. But given the below uh, rain that I've seen uh, for large uh, swaps of the region during the mom season, concluding the mom season, and the number of people we have, uh, uh, the, that I was saying uh, during my opening, close to 40 million people in the region who are in need of humanitarian assistance. But there, is, there are also another 40 million, 45 million who are on the verge of falling into that category, who are in food crisis. We encourage you to, to widely disseminate this forecast with your colleagues and prepare contingency plans accordingly. As the season progresses, follow the updates from your national meteorological services and from ITPA, uh, as we get closer to the season, the forecast will be better. To help, uh, to help adjust your plans and take ac actions as early as possible. Uh, with those few remarks, it is, it is my pleasure to declare uh, the meeting for the ARCO 59, close it. Thank you very much and, and have a safe day. Thank you very much. Zachary, back to you. If you have any uh, housekeeping announcement to do. I am not sure, uh, Zachary. I can also come in and say <laughs> thank oh, you oh, very oh, much. Oh, um, Zachary, if you, you are there. Oh, no, no. Or, or Fiona. <laughs> I think I, I think Kimoto is not giving him uh, an opportunity to talk. So. Ah, okay, okay. Well, so no, he's uh, a co-host. He's actually yeah. a co-host. Yeah, can give. But let me okay. already say thank you so much, and to let mm -hmm. everybody know that the statement that Dr. Atan read will be posted on the website today, um, and on the Hazards Watch. Um, and all the eight seasonal products are already published um, and there'll be a press release statement in about two hours from now. So everything will be on the websites today. Go to the ICPAC website, Hazards Watch website, you will find everything.
in terms of the press release statement, the official statements coming out from today's GACOF 59. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Atan, for, for reading it out for us. Um, Zachary, will you come in at this point? Hello. Uh, Hello, yes. Okay. yes. Go ahead, Zachary. Yeah, I think uh, the, the issue, maybe we need to clarify is whether the signed events are starting 2 or 2.30. Because uh, there is one we're saying 2.30, the other is 2. We may need to clarify. Um, they're all starting at 2.30. So oh. we have time for a lunch break. Okay. So 2.30. But as we said, <clears throat> if you're joining any of the first two, um, then stay on this Zoom link. You don't need to, so we won't close the Zoom link. We've closed GACO 59, it's over, it's done. Um, but don't close, don't leave this Zoom link um, if you want to join uh, one of the, either the um, uh, Hazards East Africa ha Climate Hazards Watch or the Agricultural Monitoring. Stay right here and be back before 2.30 so that you can join the breakout room you want to join. If you are joining the climate change one or the data managers group, then, um, then you can leave this Zoom meeting and you go to the link we've posted uh, for the climate change one or the invite to the other one. Um, Abu Bakr, would you like to also say anything at this point? Or any clarification? Uh, hi, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I think everything is clear so far. Uh, we just would really like to encourage the participant to stay with us and attend the different side events. Uh, they are really informative and some of them they will give you also practical information about how to use the systems that uh, ICPAC, uh, we, uh, we at ICPAC uh, developing. So the, the main goal of those systems uh, East Africa has a watch and uh, agricultural monitoring system are uh, intended for the users. Uh, and the idea of those uh, side event is to give practical sessions and to allow people to ask questions if they need any clarification on the different data layer or interpretation of the data on the system. Uh, this is the time where you can get as much as possible information about those systems. So you can continue to use them um, on your uh, daily activities or, or to use them independently to generate advisories and to take decisions um, as you see fit and as your uh, uh, job required. So I would really enc encourage all of you to come and join um, the side events, the different side events. Uh, of course, there is one of them is uh, private or like by invitation. But the rest are open and you are very welcome to, to join and, and post your questions and post your ideas. And if you have something particularly that you would like to see, uh, so uh, that this is also a good time where you can come and uh, share your ideas and share what uh, do you think um, that is missing, uh, whether it's a data layer or it's a certain application that you would like to see. So this is what I, my, my message uh, for the user. You are very welcome. Karibu sana and marhaba and we see you uh, in maybe like 30 minutes. Great, thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you so much, Abu Bakr. Um, thank you again to everybody. Thank you for staying on a Zoom call for many hours this morning. Um, we've kept in good time and um, wish you good side events this afternoon and we will now um, break here and maybe Kim, you could put back the banner um, until uh, we are ready to open this one again for the, this, the two side events continuing here in about 40 minutes, 35 minutes time. Thank you again to all of you, the participants from all the different countries in the region, really valuable, really important that you are with us for the GACOF and that you take the messages back to your country, your colleagues, your organizations, your sectors, and um, that they are useful for your work in the coming season. Once again, thank you so much to all of you, and thanks to ICPAC, um, Zachary, Dr. Artan, um, and <clears throat> all the sectors and everybody else, comms team at ICPAC, for an amazing job pulling together 
um, this this particular GACOF 59 for October to December seasonal forecast. Um, thanks again and enjoy the side events later on at 2.30 today. All the best and bye. Thank you very much, Fiona. Well done. Our worker, our worker, don't forget the other meeting. <laughs>